please rise for the centennial prayer for the courts, the national anthem, and the Supreme Court hymn. Almighty God, we stand in your holy presence as our Supreme Judge. We humbly beseech you to bless and inspire us so that what we think, say, and do will be in accordance with your will. Enlighten our minds, strengthen our spirit, and fill our hearts with fraternal love, wisdom, and understanding so that we can be effective channels of truth, justice, and peace. In our proceedings today, Guide us in the path of righteousness for the fulfillment of your greater glory. Amen.
Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Today is the public panel interview of in order uh, I don't see the Deputy Commissioner Lan S. Quidavid. So this is uh, with only three applicants present. Attorney Jeremy Benigno I. Gatdola, please stand. And sit down, thank you. Court Administrator Jose Maitas P. Marquez and Attorney Cesar L. Villanueva. The JBC welcomes you and I'm sitting here only in acting capacity. Thank you and good morning and please proceed. Proceedings now start. Your Honors, good morning. Good morning everyone. This is a continuation of the public panel interview of candidates for the positions of Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Vice the Honorable Francis Hardelesa and the Honorable Justice Antonio Carpio. The panel of interviewers are, headed, are the following, headed by the Acting Presiding Officer, Justice Andres B. Reyes, Jr., representing the Honorable Chief Justice Lucas P. Bersamin, ex officio chairperson of the Council. The Honorable Justice Jose Catral Mendoza, chairperson of the JBC Executive Committee and regular member representing the retired members of the Supreme Court. The Honorable Judge Toribio Ilao Jr., regular member representing the private sector. The Honorable Justice Noel Jimenez Tiham, representing regular member representing the Academe, and the Honorable Judge Franklin J. De Monteverde Jr., regular member representing the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. Your Honors, the candidates for interview this morning are the following: Attorney Jeremy Benigno Gatdula. Court Administrator Jose Maidas Marquez and Dean Cesar Villanueva. Your Honors, may I administer the oath? Thank you, Your Honor. Please raise your right hand so that I can administer the oath. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this public panel interview by the Judicial and Bar Council. So help you God. You may now be seated. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, okay, I'll go directly to uh, Attorney Gatdula. Your medical uh, on the blood chemistry results show that you have a high FVS and cholesterol? Uh, a little bit, I think. Uh, yes, Your Honor, a little bit, I think. Okay. Are you a diabetic? No, no. no. Just high? The FB fasting blood sugar? Yes, I'm high, yes. Yeah. And what was the result? Uh, what Can you remember the what of the uh, fasting blood sugar? Um, I, I would 
I think it would be around the normal range lang ha. But uh, the record shows here that it was high. Ah, within the high range. Ah, okay. So this will not in any way deter you from performing well, assuming that you will be appointed as an associate justice. No, Your Honor. I think it will even prove. So. Okay. Now, you have a very limited litigation experience and your record shows that you merely had a few cases that you attended to. Is that correct? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. No, for the past, we are, you're referring to the past, past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, yes, because I have been focusing my practice on certain specific areas. But on the early part of my years, I have had exp uh, extensive uh, litigation experience uh, in all uh, judicial levels. And if I may add, um, I've had also extensive practice with regard to international law cases. So in terms of litigation, I think I know, I, I know my way around the courtroom. It just so happened, I think, that the, with regard to the questionnaire, it limited to the past three years. Yeah. And so in those past three years, I only uh, accepted to appear with regard to cases relating to the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and one of them actually was just decided or given a decision last well, within the week. Uh, and so uh, I, I would say that I, my practice is, is, uh, um, would be sufficient to allow me the, the experience and the insights I think necessary. Thank you. Court Ad Marquez. The record shows that, especially the Salen, that you have two children. Uh, yes, Your Honor. But the name of the spouse is blank. That's right, Your Honor. How is it? Uh, Why is it? Because um, my, my, my marriage was uh, annulled, Your Honor. Ah, okay, so you're st now single. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Going to Attorney Villanueva. You were with the Villanueva Gabionza D Law Office from 1990 to 2011. That's that correct, correct, Your Honor. And likewise from 2016 to the present. That's correct, Your Honor. Can you explain the, the reason be, between these two periods why you were not with the Law Office? Yes, Your Honor. In 2011, Your Honor, I was uh, appointed by then President Aquino to, uh, to, ha to be the chairman of a newly established um, government agency. It was, it's the Governance Commission for GOCC, Your Honor. So in those, f in those uh, almost six years, five and a half years, Your Honor, I was, I was in public service. Uh, I, had, I withdrew from the law firm at the time I accepted the appointment and I rejoined the, the law firm. Uh, uh, after my term expired, which was co chairman with the then President Aquino, Your Honor. What was your expertise in that law firm? Um, I've always been uh, in commercial law practice, uh, Your Honor, including uh, uh, particularly on, on corporate law and corporate law litigation, Your Honor. Uh, but I still, I, I do participate in other areas where our clients would uh, request uh, our intervention or, or soccer, Your Honor. So. It's, it's pretty broad. It, it included uh, non-commercial litigation and also labor issues, Your Honor. So all of this uh, would center more on uh, consultations? Is that it? Conferences? Uh, no, Your Honor. We basically, I, I involve myself, I've always involved myself in uh, not only in special projects, uh, putting up together a deal or a merger, but I also continue to involve myself in the um, in uh, corporate commercial uh, litigation, Your Honor, especially before the um, regional trial courts uh, with special jurisdiction on, on co commercial matters, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Attorney Gatdula, you were very active in social media, particularly Facebook, five to 10 posts a day. Can you not finish a day without going to Facebook? Well, let, yes, I can, of course. You can? Yeah, of course. Mm. Do you count the likes and the shares that you see in your post? 
No, not no, not necessarily, Your Honor. And uh, the reason for also for the for the post is also because of the advocacies I have. Um, I have been uh, particularly uh, involved in issues relating to family and marriage, and um, it just so happens that social media is, I think, is one good instrument to be able to spread uh, whatever truths that I think I can share with regard to family and marriage. Um, and so, uh, yeah, of, yes, of course, if 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 if. Uh, uh, and I do think it is actually good for a person to spend some time away from social media. So it's okay. it's something that can be. So you mentioned about marriage. Mm -hmm. A bill was recently filed in Congress on divorce. What is your view on it? Um, speaking as a as a personally for my own views, not speaking as a judge, I think that uh, divorce would not be a proper uh, resort to. Uh, for the Philippines particularly, uh, I don't think that it will be in the service of the common good. Marriage is an institution that has been designed for centuries in a specific way that it be monogamous, exclusive, and permanent. And that there are reasons for it, particularly helpful to the state. Um, one of the reasons being is the fact that it stabilizes and helps those who are parties to the marriage, both the man and the woman, as well as uh, in the upbringing of children. Uh, when we look at the statistics, Many of the serial killers around, many of the mass shooters that we see in the U.S. are all brought up uh, mostly by single parents. Um, there have been a famous um, quote with regard to uh, people who have been brought up by single uh, parent households, uh, of them having the greater probability of going to jail, having lesser grades, of being, great, uh, being unemployed. The suicide rate is higher for children of, of uh, single parent uh, households. And the fact that they will also lead to have, having a marriage that will also break down in the future is also greater. So in the sense that for the state um, to encourage uh, divorce within the context that our teenage pregnancies are getting higher, uh, incest rapes are also at a, an, a very uncomfortable rate, uh, I think there are better remedies that the state can encourage by way of legislation rather than divorce. But I hasten to add again, that is my own personal view. Mm. As a judge, my view has always been to determine what the Constitution views and uh, whether or not I will rule on, on divorce in a certain way will depend on the reading of the Constitution that I see. What if the bill on divorce will be passed by Congress and you are now a sitting Associate Justice of the Supreme Court and an issue is brought before you? Um, then you can consider everything I just said earlier uh, taken away and disregarded. I will look at the provisions of the bill and then see how the Constitution would respond to the provisions of that specific bill. Um, it's easy cause it, to make uh, presumptions because of the word divorce itself and all the connotations around it. But what is important is actually the, pre the, the content or the provisions of the bill itself. So if uh, it is possible, and, um, and I've always viewed that it perhaps be better for the Supreme Court to defer with regard to matters of discretion and also uh, determinations of, of, of matters like these to the Congress. Um, judicial restraint would also be, be coming in uh, in the calculations I make with, when I make these decisions re uh, relating to marriage. So it would appear that uh, from what you had said that uh, your moral or uh, religious convictions will uh, deter you from performing the job uh, correctly? No, no. Uh, I, I, I actually made it uh, specifically clear that uh, whatever I mentioned earlier with regard to my personal views on marriage, uh, you will have to disregard that already uh, when you ask me the question, uh, what will I do as a judge? As I said, as a yes, judge. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. So I will. So you will follow the the, the law, um, even if your moral or your religious convictions would be otherwise. Um, yes, Your Honor. Um, there's a saying that I I, I believe in. Uh, I think it was from Justice Scalia. A, a judge who is very happy with with every one of his decisions is a bad judge. I think we will have to Correct. follow mm. the truth wherever it leads, even if it's something that we disagree with. Okay. Uh, your views on this, uh, Court Ad on the bill filed in Congress on divorce? Uh, <clears throat> Your Honor, um, first I think um, if it's uh, going to conflict with any of existing laws, then uh, that will have to be looked into. Um, 
with regard <clears throat> my personal uh, biases uh, I think uh, that is uh, something that um, I will have to decide in accordance with uh, what I think no? uh, with and that will uh, and my personal biases will uh, come into play um, I think that is the essence of a collegial body because uh, each justice each judge have their own philosophies their own um, biases their own uh, uh, upbringings and uh, advocacy so um, that is where they will have to discuss um, and uh, throw in their views and then uh, decide uh, afterwards taking everything into consideration your views on this uh, personal views attorney Villanueva I, I believe in a divorce uh, uh, law uh, should be enacted uh, I believe in it and I, th I think it's good for society uh, I think that our stance on annulment is basically a de facto divorce uh, law anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. And instead of doing this and protecting more the, although marriage is an, uh, is an inviolable social institution, it should be protected only when it promotes um, the relationship within the spouses and the children. And when the marriage is no longer there, when the love and affection and respect is no longer there, I think that spouses should be granted the liberty to part ways and then build new marriages and a divorce would actually allow the protection of those who, of the rights uh, of, of those who are no longer related to one another rather than doing an action that's called annulment that, uh, that is difficult to, to obtain uh, anyway, uh, Your Honor. Thank you. Now you were the first chairman of the Governance Commission on G for GOCCs from 2011 to 2016, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, what is your take on the public's opinion that instead of piloting the development and growth of GOCCs, the GCG became another bureaucratic layer in the already confounded structure of checks and balances, and that GCG overlaps with the COA, the NEDA, the GPPB and the OGCC. Your Honor, um, it does not, uh, first of all, it does not overlap if you look at the charter of the Governance Commission for GOCCs because it's cons it's co it is actually not doing cause work. It is concentrated on what it, it calls good corporate governance when it comes to the, to the pu public corporate sector. Therefore, it, the, the mission of the GCG is to put into uh, the GOCC sector the same great practices, good governance practices as mm -hmm. they practice them in, in government and, and therefore to allow uh, GOCCs to contribute to national development and that in fact, Your Honor, the, the records would show that since uh, the Governance Commission for GOCCs was constituted, the record of declaration of dividends because they're overseen in how they, they, they operate uh, has the dividends that they declared to government has increased over the years and even after my term, uh, in, uh, in the three-year term, the, uh, so far in the three years since the new commission have come in, commissioners have come in, still it's a breaking record every year. Uh, it has become one of the main sources uh, by which the government is able to fund many of its uh, social and developmental fundings. Um, there are criticisms, uh, Your Honor, about the, the fact that it is not as effective, that it tends to overlap. And I think that that may be contributed to the fact that the new commissioners had a, well, they had a, um, they had to get experience on how it is. It is technical work, Your Honor. It's just not corporate governance. It, it goes into redoing, revamping the organization and, and setting out the proper remuneration. So you attribute that to, to the fact that there was a growing up pains of trying to understand how, the, how the, it works, Your Honor. But even then, they continued in each of those three years to, to be able to supervise the GOCCs to be declaring uh, dividends that are record-breaking every year, Your Honor. So in that respect, perhaps, Your Honor, uh, the GCG continues to be relevant, Your, Your Honor. Thank you. For the past year that you have been with the Supreme Court, what is your greatest contribution and what long-term programs do you want to initiate if appointed as uh, an Associate Justice Court Ad? Uh, <coughs> Your Honor, I think, uh, <coughs> uh, 
I think it would be a court automation. Uh, I think uh, the court uh, and all its offices, uh, the Supreme Court and all its offices, including all the lower courts, third level courts, second level court, and first level courts, should be fully automated, Your Honor. So if and when appointed, um, I will uh, pursue and um, <coughs> uh, advocate uh, full automation of our uh, court system, Your Honor. Attorney Gardula, are you satisfied with the recent ruling you got from the Supreme Court on the same-sex marriage? Did you expect that ruling? Um, yes, Your Honor. I'm actually quite happy with the ruling. It was the ruling that we could reasonably get from the Supreme Court, despite what the media is saying, that um, it was a mere technicality. I, I believe it is not a technicality. It's actually a fundamental question that the Supreme Court upheld in that ruling, and that is uh, with regard to the matter subject proper for judicial review, the fact that there should be indeed standing, and the fact that um, there is uh, a bit of, uh, uh, when, when needed, uh, the respect for judicial hierarchy. Now, if, if I may yeah. um, Go ahead. answer uh, also a question, for example, uh, that was directed to um, uh, Mr. Midas Marquez, or Attorney Mai uh, Midas. Um, and, and that's actually one of the things that I was thinking of in terms of uh, innovations with regard to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, and this I mentioned in the first public hearing, which is with regard to the uh, establishment of more judicial consistency in the rulings, particularly in the philosophical strain. And at the same time, um, really uh, engage and provide better um, uh, improvements in the understanding of the bench and bar with regard to ju uh, judicial hierarchy. I, I believe that the Court of Appeals has uh, a huge amount of potential right now that is, uh, that is not being used. I remember a time you know, when I was growing up as a young lawyer and also when I was in law school that uh, rulings of the Court of Appeals would be actually considered as major jurisprudence, particularly since they do not sometimes get appealed to the Supreme Court. Now every single case that essentially goes to the Court of Appeal seemingly goes to the direction not to the, to the Supreme Court. In, in which case I feel that it, there is uh, 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 underutilization of the talent and wisdom that are found with regard to the justice in the CA. And so I, I think uh, a strict adherence to the, to the uh, judicial hierarchy will provide uh, a more varied interest, decisions, wisdom, insights, inputs. Uh, rather than having it concentrated within uh, or coming from the Supreme Court. So. Let's go back to the same-sex marriage. What if one day Julie goes to you and tells you that she belongs to the LGBT plus community and that she wants to marry her girl best friend? How will you handle the situation? Uh, essentially, uh, I will treat her and uh, with all the love and respect that is due to, uh, that is, uh, that should be for my daughter. But whatever personal considerations I may have with regard to any family member, to any close uh, person to me, is it, really beside the point. The reason why we have laws is to remove the discretion decision from one's own personal um, predilections and see what would be the best for the community at large. So even if, for example, of course I would want her to be happy, of course I would want her uh, to feel every benefit that society can provide, um, but if you're going to be asking me as a judge what would be the best uh, course that I could rule upon in order to uh, ensure that society, our society goes towards a common good, uh, I will have to rule upon it in the way I think the Constitution provides. And uh, since my daughter was brought into the discussion, uh, I would be very frank in saying that I think she would understand very much as well the position I will take vis-a-vis -vis her. Um, which, which is what I just mentioned, that, even, uh, that as a person, as a, as a person, personal, personal. Ah. as a person, as a father, um, nothing will change. She, she is still my daughter. She, I will love her as much as I can. But... Uh, I, my daughter she, so she would allow her to go ahead uh, she's and a, uh, marry her girl best friend. Uh, she's an adult. She can do what she wants as mm -hmm. long as, of course, it's within the law. But she also knows but that will I'm not uh, that will not uh, will that not interfere with your religious convictions or moral convictions. 
Well, my, my re- well, okay. uh, with regard to my religious convictions, uh, the Catholic Church has always preached charity and has always preached understanding. It is not for me to judge her. Um, I, I leave that up to God. Um, of course, I, like any parent, I would like to guide her to what is best uh, into what I believe in. And as I was about to say earlier, my daughter also knows the public aspects of my life. And that uh, if I do have public duties, she will understand that as well. If my public duties contradicts with her personal convictions, um, I'm sure she will pretty much understand that. Okay, thank you. You were in the, you are in the private practice for 28 years. And as per your PDS, you have no judiciary experience. What do you think is your biggest advantage among other applicants who already have this experience in the judiciary? I think uh, it would be bringing into um, decision-making of the courts, basically, what they call the private sector experience, especially practitioners' experience in, in all matters that are before the courts, whether it's a commercial law aspect or civil law aspect. And therefore, uh, as well as uh, being able to bring with it with my experience in government, I was uh, not only the chairman of uh, the Governance Commission, I was for many years the, um, with the Philippine Judicial Academy, and I participated in the training of uh, newly appointed judges, uh, as well as judges in up, uh, updating them in matters that are in, in developments in commercial law. So it's being able to bring into, into a perspective that may be unique in the sense that I do have public sector experience, I do have private sector experience, but in, in academic experience to look at things, to always question the way things have, been, have always been and how to make them better, as well as the practice experience that allows uh, the toss and tumbles that you experience in, in, in commerce, in the market, to be, to be brought into the discussions of the issues that are raised before the, the courts. Your Honor. Thank you. Your take on this, uh, court ad. Uh, <clears throat> Your Honor, uh, I've been with the court for almost um, 28 years. I've been a law clerk for, I think, around 19 years for uh, different um, eminent jurists. I've, uh, I've uh, learned and uh, seen their uh, strengths and uh, weaknesses. And, uh, of course, I've tried to avoid the weaknesses and uh, emulated the strengths. In the last uh, almost 10 years, I've been a court administrator. I've uh, spoken for the court as a, a head of the public information office for almost five years. And then again, when the incumbent uh, chief justice was uh, appointed, uh, <clears throat> uh, I was again requested to head that office for a few months. Um, I've dealt with the uh, two branches of government. I've seen the court through different impeachment cases. Uh, I think uh, my experience will uh, be able to help uh, the 15-man court in, uh, in uh, addressing uh, various issues that would uh, confront the Supreme Court, Your Honor. Attorney Villanueva, this may be peanuts for you, but uh, we would like to know the answer to the question, what is the Realty Installment Buyer Act, or commonly known as the Maceda Law, and how is it applied? Uh, the Maceda law is uh, a special law governing in the law on sales that governs the, uh, the remedies of precision uh, that may be availed of by an unpaid seller when it comes to a particular type of sale, uh, sale of realty on, ins- uh, on installments. Uh, it is the counterpart of the recto law, so to speak, which governs the remedies available when it comes to sale of movables on installments. And basically it seeks to protect the um, the constitutional right of our people to abode that they should be protected when uh, the basis of what the subject matter that they buy is basically um, residential uh, real estate or a residential condominium unit or owner. And it basically allows um, for somebody who has paid uh, the purchase price over several years, like for example more than two years, then, and he cannot pay anymore, the buyer, he basically is allowed uh, the ability to, before it is rescinded, uh, to, to a grace period, a minimum of 60 days, within which to update his account without penalty, in spite of a penalty provision provided for, uh, and not being avail- avail- 
availing of that grace period, then the seller can only rescind by a notarial rescission, and even then, if it's more than two years, he would be allowed, the buyer would be allowed to receive a cash surrender value, so to speak, Your Honor. Thank you. Differentiate between option money and earnest money, and when is payment considered upon option or on earnest? Attorney Gatdula. Sorry, Your Honor, I have no idea. Thank you. I'll pass. <laughs> okay, you'll pass. How about you, uh, Portad? Your Honor, my uh, recollection is that um, um, an option money is um, is uh, something that you pay for ahead uh, before uh, purchasing something. Mm -hmm. And then later on, uh, you have that option whether or not to... Uh, uh, <coughs> To, to purchase that uh, thing, um, um, it it binds the it binds the seller because of the option money uh, given uh, prior to the purchase. Um, <clears throat> uh, the earnest money um, is just uh, showing or um, or just uh, indicating to the seller that uh, you have an interest in purchasing that uh, thing, and therefore. Uh, and, and to consider your, uh, your offer of uh, purchasing your own. Attorney Gadula, are you also a uh, columnist? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Cite me the worst written decision by the Supreme Court for you in terms of content and writing style. The worst. Pass? So it's not that. I mean, uh, there are certainly in rulings that I disagree with, mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of writing style, content, and what have I okay, think yeah, they're uh, pretty much. Uh, 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 I, I disagree, of course, with the ruling in the in the Grace Poe case. Okay. Um, uh, Concentrate on that now. I'm sorry. On the Poe case, na lang. Yeah, uh, for, for, uh, which, which I think because of the fact that uh, there had been uh, a jump made and I believe that uh, it, it, it deviated a little from the words of, the, what, of what the Constitution required of it being a natural born citizen. Um, but uh, so in terms of that, I, I think uh, I, would, I would probably uh, say that's one uh, ish or ruling I would disagree with. Uh, I wouldn't say it's bad, it's just that I disagree with. Uh, the other one, and uh, this one would really uh, pains my heart to say, is the RH law ruling. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry for <laughs> but uh, But the reason is because of the fact that, well, but to be serious about it, I, the, the point that I wanted to make in that particular ruling was the issue with regard to the, sub, the, the giving of or setting aside of tax money for the subsidization of contraceptives, which I believe was not taken up. I was hoping that it would be taken up. Instead, the focus was made on the um, matters with regard to the when life begins, which I believe is a red herring issue. Um, I, I think the, the real main issue there was the, the propriety of setting aside tax funds for a matter which is not illegal in the first place. But as I said, it, it's something that I disagree with, but I wouldn't say it's a bad ruling. Okay. So. You are also in the academe, and you previously applied for chairmanship of the Legal Education Board. Did you apply, or you were appointed? Or you had been appointed? No, I, I, I applied, but later on I would do my You withdrew. My you, you withdrew your uh, application. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a move to abolish the LEB. What do you think about it? it it's really something that needs to be considered of. My, my philosophy has always been to uh, have a lesser control, a lesser reach of government or control of government uh, as is possible. I, I think one, another layer of bureaucracy uh, is not uh, necessarily needed. I, I mean, I must say this is my personal views. This is not something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and thus, uh, if, there if there is uh, a, a possibility of removing the LEB, uh, it's not something I would necessarily disagree with. But having seen the realities of, of legal education in the Philippines, the fact that there are certain law schools that are uh, less than optimal in, in servicing 
and providing benefits to law students, I, I think a regulatory body such as the LEB is needed. Um, not as much as, as uh, reg uh, regulations in order to push law schools to a certain direction, but certainly to guide them to a certain way uh, to meet the challenges of, of uh, legal education, both within the Philippines and the demands that, uh, sp that is posed outside, uh, uh, outside the Philippines in terms of the globe, more or less the, the development of the global um, changes in the legal practice. Um, I don't, so bottom line, I don't think it's a necessity, uh, but there could be ways to make the LEB more helpful to legal education. Thank you. Court Ad? As it is, the power to appoint judges and justices of the court is lodged before the president. There are, however, some sectors or some proponents who seek to remove from the president the authority to name the members of the judiciary, including the, 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 those in the Sandigan Bayan, and instead the same be transferred to the members of the Supreme Court themselves who are supposedly in a better position to choose the incoming members of the judiciary. Your opinion on this? Um, I think, Your Honor, that the um, appointing power belonging to the president is part of the um, <coughs> uh, um, ch check and balance between the judiciary and the executive department. Um, we have a JBC, and the mandate of the JBC is to uh, screen uh, the appointments to the judiciary. And I think uh, when the JBC gives a short list to the president, that is a limitation already on the appointing authority of the president. And therefore, the president being able to choose um, members of the court from the Supreme Court down to the first level court, I think, can be retained. Uh, because uh, anyway, the JBC is headed by the Chief Justice, Your Honor. Thank you. Your opinion on this, Attorney Gatdula? The, there is a lot to be said for the process in the, in the U.S. wherein the President has wide latitude to make the appointments. But in the end, the uh, approval of that appointment will be made by the Commission on Appointments in the, in the U.S. And it has become highly politicized. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know or I cannot be in a position to say whether or not the JBC has removed the, that uh, politicization aspect. But I think the fact that we are, that the JBC is composed uh, from various sectors of the legal uh, uh, practice, from the, le from the academe, and, and very importantly as well, those who are present and past members of the Supreme Court who have knowledge already of the collegial aspect of the, of the job, uh, and and uh, the demands of the job. I think it's. Uh, I think there's much to be said for it. That uh, the recommendations will be coming from a body uh, of people who have already seen what the job entails and um, what what would be the personal, behavioral, psychological, mental, and ca characteristics needed for a person who is supposed to be working within a body rather than just working uh, as one person. So. Attorney Villanueva. I agree with uh, uh, Justice Mayres that uh, perhaps it's, it's important to remove as much uh, politics, the, the Supreme Court from so much politics, granting the Supreme Court the power to appoint uh, the, members, uh, the uh, members of the judiciary would actually put its smack into exercising um, what is essentially an executive power. And therefore, it brings the Supreme Court again into the limelight of uh, lobbying and politics and, and things like that. In, under the current setup, Your Honor, it, uh, the Supreme Court has the power of uh, discipline uh, over judges which are appointed, who are appointed by the executive. And, and for it to be the one to appoint them and then to discipline them just doesn't smack well in the sense that uh, if it does not appoint well, then it, it, it will not show that it has not done its job by removing so many uh, of this. So I think that that line, that check and balance was, uh, Justice Midas has said is uh, so important in order to preserve uh, the important role of the Supreme Court to be the, the final arbiter of uh, national issues, Your Honor. Okay. What reforms would you want to initiate in the Philippine bar exams if appointed to Supreme Court? Is pass or fail system of checking paper practicable? I do not believe in 
passed or failed uh, just is because uh, the legal profession is one that requires the best and the brightest only to put for them to engage because we hold into our hands aside from those who assume the, the judge position uh, the life liberty and property of many of our people and to 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 gather as uh, to to be able to visualize some of the uh, the visions for uh, many of the great issues that are at hand. So it should be allowed only to those who can demonstrate the highest, uh, the best knowledge of, of, of uh, the law, so to speak. So what I would introduce, Your, your Honor, is uh, basically the same uh, one that uh, Justice V.B. Mendoza did in a monogram that, uh, to, to institutionalize, so to speak, the MCQ uh, in a way that uh, it, it's not just uh, uh, one type of MCQ, but it will... It will gather, but the only thing that was not adopted there, Your Honor, is that there has to be a panel of examiners. It cannot be that you appoint uh, uh, examiners every year in order to provide the MCQ because that's a whole body of law that will be organized in each of the eight subjects that will cover everything uh, from, from mere ideas to being able to resolve uh, putting problems into uh, a practical uh, question and then for them to choose and, and therefore and sometimes MCQs have to be calibrated well, and that can only be done by, by professionals, uh, examiners who are full-time, who look at it every year. That allows the Supreme Court, therefore, the ability to, to offer, because there's so many uh, who are asking to take the bar, almost 9,000 uh, each year. That, that allows uh, the giving of the bar exam twice a year, Your Honor, because if, it's, uh, if the computation is, uh, is computerized, then it's easy to come up with the results, and it can be held in, in various regions, Your Honor. So, so the MCQ to, uh, to me is uh, uh, as, has been done by many studies. Probably is the superior is a good way of trying to, to do that, and it could be dovetailed with something like uh, uh, putting into the curriculum what we call uh, apprenticeship, so that that other aspect is gets to be served also, Your Honor. In your case. Uh Cortad, is pass or fail system of checking the papers practicable? Uh, Your Honor, I have uh, so much respect for uh, Dean Villanueva. He was my professor in college, but I will have to uh, give another on the opposing view, Your Honor. Um, I think uh, pass or fail is worth looking into. Um, I think uh, we have to think of what is really the objective of uh, national bar examinations. Uh, in the past years, no, uh, many of our uh, law students have been affixed uh, with uh, landing in the top 10, getting a higher grade than the rest. Uh, I think that misses the point on, uh, on, uh, because I think uh, the objective really of a national bar examination is to determine whether or not an applicant or an examinee is already uh, equipped with the necessary knowledge to um, to pass the bar no? or to to become a lawyer and uh, therefore i think uh, it has to be um, it has to be uh, thought very well no? whether it's uh, we continue with the essay type or purely mcq is another issue your honor but i think the present essay type uh, if ever we're going to institutionalize mcqs i think the present essay type should not be done away with I think maybe a certain percentage should be MCQs and a certain percentage should be uh, SA type. Probably Attorney Gadula may have a Solomonic approach to the two views, to the two reforms enunciated by the two. What could be the reforms that you want to initiate? Actually, coincidentally, I agree with both of them. Oh. <laughs> No, um, the uh, court administrator Marquez is correct. With, uh, I, I think there's some much to be said with regard to the pass or fail. At the same time, um, Dean Villanueva, uh, I, I agree with with regard to the MCQ. Um, perhaps there should be combinations with essays because it's also good to see the legal writing. So in which case, I'll focus my comments on this, partic uh, on this aspect. Number one, and, and since you asked me earlier with regard to the LEB, um, we have around, by my calculations, and I wrote an article about this, uh, around 17, 18,000 who want to enter law school of the 17 or 18,000, eventually will probably going will be going down to around nine or something thousand at the end of the of the um, the four-year period. 
at around nine or something thousand around seven probably we'll be taking the bar of the seven who will take the bar we'll probably have around one thousand one thousand five hundred who will pass the bar so you essentially had around 17 or 15,000 people who wanted initially to enter law, law, uh, law school who probably should not have entered law school in the first place because of the fact that all the waste of time, money, resources, and what have you. So in, in essence, uh, I think the bar exams is far better off not being the final arbiter of what is the quality uh, of, of, of law students who will now become lawyers. I think it should be from the very beginning, which I think the field set is, is uh, perhaps um, possible in, in, in being helpful about at the same time the four years and then the the the, the final one would be the bar exam but to pour, pour everything into the bar exam is is I think uh, not working not feasible and not sustainable uh, having said that I completely agree with um, uh, increasing the venues uh, uh, on the three region on the uh, the zone besides Mindanao uh, and also um, well, one thing that we've also written extensively about, and I've, I, I don't, and I've not been very popular about this, I've not become popular because of this, is to remove or try to minimize you know, the bar operations. It's an extreme amount of expenses being placed on law students and law schools. And in the end, it doesn't really help in legal academics. Uh, it just makes people just chant around the streets and what have you. But I, I think in the end, it's better minimized and or perhaps even done away with. Kortad, you were shortlisted for this position four times already. What do you think are the reason or re reasons that you didn't make it? Well, Your Honor, uh, do you feel that today today is your best time? Well, um, it's always my best time, Your Honor. <laughs> But I think uh, it's really a, a pres presidential prerogative, Your Honor. Once uh, shortlisted, uh, it's up to the president uh, who he wants to appoint. And therefore, uh, that uh, presidential prerogative should be respected, Your Honor. In your case, uh, Attorney Villanueva, you have been shortlisted three times. In what aspect do you think you lacked for not getting the appointment or an appointment? I think it's the same. I, I have the same answer as Justice uh, Marquez. Um, basically, uh, the president uh, uh, appoints those whom he considers to be uh, the best in the shortlist, Your Honor. And we must respect that because that's uh, how the constitutional setup is. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also respect the process uh, because we keep coming back, applying, uh, hoping that uh, somehow the process would respect uh, whatever merits we bring. Uh, and our applying, in spite of uh, not being chosen by the president is a sign of our respect that we, we believe uh, in the process that's set out by the Constitution through the JDC, Your Honor. Thank you. I have a few more questions here. Uh, Cortad. Uh, what is the doctrine of processual presumption? For your honor, I'll okay. have to pass it. Attorney Gadula. Uh, I'll pass uh, for, for, the, for the moment on this one. Your honor. Attorney Villanueva. My understanding of that uh, doctrine, Your Honor, is that uh, whenever e anything has been passed, uh, has been processed or vetted in, uh, in a gov government or any agency, then uh, we presume that the normal course of uh, complying with the procedures mandated by law have been passed. And it is the person who says that the, process, the proceedings have not been held in accordance uh, with what the law provides that has the burden of proof of uh, proving otherwise. Kortad, this is your brainchild, the uh, telehearing. According to, the, to you, the said telehearing method would somehow address jail overcrowding, decongest court of cases, and result in speedy disposition of the same. Do you think this innovation will bring difference as to the acceleration of court processes and why? Uh, Your Honor, um, before I answer, <coughs> I'd just like to 
put it on record that uh, um, it was actually first uh, requested by the jail warden of Davao City uh, that uh, we um, do telehearing or at the time or video conferencing which we eventually adopted. Um, I only um, recommended that uh, we do it to the court uh, but it was actually the brainchild of uh, the jail warden of Davao City who is no longer, who, who actually uh, has retired already. When, when uh, the last time I went to, the, to visit Davao City Jail, I was looking for her, uh, but she has, left, uh, she has retired already because the letter of the Davao City Jail Warden, I think, was sometime still in 2017. No? And when I first uh, recommended it, uh, we had a different um, composition of the court back then. But anyway, Your Honor, uh, to address your second uh, concern, um, provided that the um, constitutional rights of the accused will always be respected, it is my firm belief that video conferencing can speed up uh, court processes. Uh, it can also um, uh, lessen, if not totally remove the risk posed by high-profile inmates being transported from the court, or from the jail to the court and vice versa because you remove that, um, that um, risk that they can be rescued and that um, the, J the, um, the wardens, the BJMP office, uh, officials will be, uh, they're, they're, uh, there will be dangers to their uh, safety and security. And also, of course, uh, the, um, the risk attendant to, or the risk that is attendant whenever a high-risk inmate is in court facing the judge, the court personnel, the public watching, that risk will also uh, be eliminated. Now, in many instances, Your Honor, the BJMP or the wardens are not able to bring the accused to court because of some um, uh, concerns, no? Uh, no? No transportation to bring them, uh, and so many others, and that uh, and that uh, set sets back the hearing. The hearing will be postponed. It will again be um, uh, scheduled, maybe two three months later, no? and that uh, delays the proceeding. Another another major issue or point, Your Honor, is for uh, those who are um, serving final sentence in state penitentiaries. There is an existing policy of the Supreme Court that those serving final sentence cannot be brought out of court to, um, to attend if, let's say, they have other cases. And therefore, video conferencing will, uh, will um, play a very big uh, role here. No? Um, these uh, state, uh, in, uh, uh, inmates in the state penitentiaries will no longer have to be transported out of the, of the um, state penitentiaries and their hearings uh, trials can proceed because uh, we have uh, if we if we're going to be able to have video conferencing uh, nationwide, Your Honor. Now we have seen the appointment of uh, many uniformed men to the different branches of the government. Can the principle of civilian supremacy be used as a defense? to question these appointments. Attorney Villanueva? Not at all, uh, Your Honor. Uh, precisely, it is the appointing power is uh, the civilian, the number one civilian politician, the president. And therefore, when he appoints uh, people who have retired from the military, that just shows the supremacy of civilian authority over, over the military, Your Honor. Your, your view, Attorney Gatdula? Uh, same. And also when the military men have uh, left the military, they're, all, they're essentially civilians already. So it's the civilian supremacy rule applies. My last question. What do you understand of uh, this phrase, rights beget responsibilities and progress begets change. Attorney Villanueva. Um, I think it, the first uh, part of the phrase comes from uh, 
may be adopted from what was said in uh, the Spider-Man movie that he was given much uh, power, has much responsibility. Uh, in other words, the rights basically are things that are given in the hands, recognized by law to be something that is in the hands of, uh, of uh, individuals who have a right to demand it, not from it, from others, from the state. But in exercising those rights, it is so important to realize that uh, we're all part of a community and therefore we must be responsible for uh, demanding those rights in a manner that not only protects uh, our interests but those of uh, the community at large. Uh, the second part of the praise, uh, therefore, has something to do with uh, being able to realize that we live in an age where changes are uh, ever, ever coming when it comes to values, not only the technology. And therefore, it is important for us to look at uh, the rights that are there and uh, see whether those rights are not supposed, are, are undermining the ability of a community to adopt the new changes. And therefore, when those changes have to be there, then uh, for the better good of the people, for more, then we should move as a community towards those, that end. Yeah. Your understanding of this, Attorney Gatdula? Um, well, that, that the rights essentially lead to responsibilities. But it's essentially something I disagree with. Uh, I would probably go more for, for what Cardinal Henry New John Henry Newman once said, that we have rights because we have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So in essence, actually, we have responsibilities first. That, and that is because we have responsibilities. That is that's the reason why we have rights. Um, with regard to the second phrase, pr uh, progress begets change. Not necessarily, well, okay, fine. There may be change, but not necessarily good change. Not every progress leads to good change, and it's something... Whatever change there must be must always be, I think, taken into consideration. The, the first clause, which is with regard to the rights. Ultimately, my point is this, is that if we're going to change as a society, it must have a certain mooring or anchor. If we move away from that anchor, then I think it's something that will just leave us adrift. Cortad? So. Uh, Your Honor, I would, like, I would um, fuse both uh, views. I think... Um, it is only when you, when one exercises that right, will uh, uh, that will result to uh, uh, responsibility. And um, when, um, when when and when um, everyone um, avails or um, exercises those rights and become responsible, of course, uh, that would lead to uh, progress, Your Honor. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, that was my last question. Uh, good luck. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Justice Ray. Uh, thank you, Honorable Franklin J. De Montebede, Sr. Our next regular member interviewer will be the Honorable Judge Toribio E. Ilo, Jr., regular member representing the private sector. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Justice... Uh, Andrea, yes. Good luck. Ay, good luck. Not yet uh, your time. <laughs> but, uh, thank, you, thank you. The, the questions uh, trusted by uh, Tony, uh, Judge uh, De Montebede were too amazing and the quest, uh, answers were also very impressive, the applicants. But uh, for the record, we had uh, ex extensively interviewed uh, those applicants. That's all right, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Chila, uh, for uh, one minute only. Yes, sir. Uh. All right, uh, Attorney Gatdula, uh, shortlisting you over other applicants who have been with the judiciary for many years could be taken to mean as uh, disregarding careerism in the Judiciary. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, the, the provisions of the Constitution have been drafted with regard to making the qualifications for a Supreme Court Justice and the composition of the body to get from as wide a range as possible um, uh, to compose that 15-man body. Um, I, I think that to get, for example, members of the court from a certain limited number of a pool, for example, great that 
great though that pool may be, and even to limit, for example, the, the pool to a limited number of schools, great though those schools may be, I think would be a disservice. I think the better thing is to, tr to try to expand the, the, the pool and, and see if um, uh, there could be ad other insights, uh, better tensions, positive tensions created because of the different experiences and backgrounds. Um, and if I may add one thing, uh, and I wasn't given an opportunity to answer, but of course, uh, but if I could only suggest this, uh, one thing I think I'd like to be able to provide, for example, to the court, is that if I had got, if I get in, uh, I'd be probably there, good health permitting for the next 20, 21 years. And uh, hopefully I will be able to provide very much a, a stable amount of institutional memory to be able to guide the younger members of the court who will follow in the appointment after me. Uh, and it's something I think that the court, uh, uh, as, is, as it is now, and with all due respect to all the members of the court, uh, is, is uh, I think, a bit lacking. When we look, for example, at the appointments made at the U.S. Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas was around 41, Robert jo uh, George, John Roberts is around uh, 49 or 50, and their ability to stay in the courts allows them to be able to shape, craft a very fairly consistent, continuous, and stable uh, body of, of jurisprudence. So um, I think there is much to be said for appointing those who are very much experienced in the judiciary, but at the same time, perhaps also those who are um, outsiders of it as well. Thank you. Thank you. At, uh, do you mean to say there's no justice who guides the present members of the higher court? No, you know, I didn't say that. But, um, but, and I say this again with all due respect, but a lot of the justices, for example, would be at most be gone in 10 years uh, from, the f from the time of appointment. And uh, I mean, there are, I think a, uh, an institution, I think any institution would benefit, uh, and I, I'm sure the Supreme Court does as well when it has uh, uh, staffers, for example, or members who are in the administration who last for decades or more with the, with the group. Um, there are certain things that documents, certain things that uh, technology will not be able to supply. And uh, for somebody who will be there in the court itself, uh, for, for the next 20 years, I, I think it's, it's uh, fairly helpful. Um, court Administrator Marquez actually mentioned this because this is one of his strengths, the fact that he has been in the court for so long. But, I, as, uh, but again, but nobody's there right now in the Supreme Court itself who could last that long as well. And I think it would be fairly helpful for members of the court coming in uh, moving forward. Moving forward to what direction? Um, for me, uh, I, uh, and I'm taking your question quite seriously in this one, I, I think it's really more for uh, moving the court towards uh, greater consistency, stability uh, with regard to jurisprudence. At the same time, hopefully, uh, and I say this again with all respect to, to all the jurisprudence that has been made before, um, to bring it back to the original meaning of the Constitution, um, assuming that our present Constitution stays without being changed, but I, I, but there have been, I think, some some uh, rulings that perhaps that were made that were m giving more a nod to policy considerations rather than to the actual text or lack of it in the consti. Um, Judge Mont de Monteverde mentioned er, uh, asked me earlier what some of the rulings that uh, I felt were I found disagreeable. I could mention some more. The one with regard to the Sapaco uh, Oil Depot. The other one would be some Manila Hotel and the others. And these are, I think, rulings that in a way deviated from the actual text uh, of, of the law. And I hope that the Supreme Court could go back to, to focusing on that. Your uh, expertise is in international economic law and policy? Yes, sir, international law. And perhaps uh, I, I do a, a fair amount of studies on the philosophy of law as well as the Constitution. In the Supreme Court, uh, however, you could be assigned cases involving complex issues in different fields of law. How do you intend to resolve those cases outside of your expertise? Um, the Supreme Court essentially is, this is, uh, job is to look at the constitutionality of law, treaties, customs, and what have you. And a fair amount of my study, and actually a lot of my work, particularly with regard to the past couple of cases that have appeared before the Supreme Court, dealt with the Constitution. Uh, 
Um, of course, my, I, I have been known more to work on international law, and I'm sure that there will be international law cases, but everything proceeds from the Constitution. Having said that, in all the years that I've been practicing, I've been practicing law for almost for more than two decades now. If you, if you work on international economic law, and if you work on issues relating, for example, to the Constitution, and also with regard to the WTO and ASEAN, it, ex uh, it exposes you to a whole lot of other areas, commercial law, taxation, negotiable instruments, and the like, uh, obligations and contracts, definitely, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, I will not claim to be of utter, uh, of, of utter expertise in all the minute of other fields of law, but it's something that I have, I think I would be able to fairly grasp the moment the, the issues come up. Are you in the proper forum? Are you in the proper forum? Because it seems that uh, there is a vacancy in the, as ambassador in Hague. You know. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, and I mentioned earlier that with regard to the work that I've done, a lot of it has focused on the consti, on the Constitution. Um, I've done a fair amount of work also teaching, also public advocacy, also law, uh, speaking before law groups and other associations with regard to um, the way our constitution works, the way I think the constitution should be understood, the way the, our constitution should be interpreted. Um, I, I, I have a very great amount of respect for the person who uh, I think used to represent us in The Hague. I think he's also an applicant right now before us, see uh, Ambassador Manuel Tihanki. Um, he's actually, uh, uh, I consider him a close friend. But um, in answer to your question, yes, this is the job I think I should be doing. How close with the ambassador? Um, he's actually my godfather. Uh, so. Okay, uh, in your uh, Facebook page, you openly post comments against the LGBT's right, fight rather for reforms in the church, school, laws in daily lives. Could you briefly yet fully explain your point of view to those coming from a different perspective? Yes, and, um, and if people, uh, I invite actually people to read the, the Facebook post that I have. I, I actually do not say anything against the LGBT uh, as a group themselves. The comments that I make is on the, uh, on the propriety or necessity or even validity of the bills that they are proposing. In the case, for example, of the SOGI laws, my position has always been that it is unnecessary because uh, since all of us are human beings, we are already all covered by certain laws existing at the present time. There is, in, there is an SWS survey that says that 85% of Filipinos accept the LGBT and they should be given rights. And for which I said that actually 85% is too low. All of us, 100% of Filipinos, should be accepting the LGBT and giving equal treatment to them. But that is a different question on whether or not the LGBT already has that equal treatment. And, um, and of course, we're talking of equal treatment in the case, in the sense that in the context of whether or not there's proper classification involved in the making of legislation. Having said that, I think that the areas with regard to same-sex marriage, for example, and also with regard to uh, the SOGI laws, are, are not appropriate instances for legislation for, for, for all the reasons that I enumerated in my uh, Facebook page. And uh, how could you maximize technology and social media in the Supreme Court if and when you're appointed? That's, a, that's actually a very good question. And in fact, one of the things I'm pondering on... The questions are not very good. Uh, no. uh, actually, all of them are good. It's hard so, not to... Sorry. sorry. <laughs> Um, sorry for the redundancy. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry to distract you. Uh, no, actually, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, and actually I was thinking about that, Your Honor, because one of the things also I'd like to address is the fact that um, right now we have around 40, I mean, if, if Wikipedia is, to be, uh, is, is a good guide, we have around 40 to 50,000 practicing lawyers right now in the Philippines who are alive at any given time. But uh, around that 40 or 50,000, many of them will not be into litigation. Uh, most will be using it either for their uh, government uh, qualifications or, or what have you in the academe or perhaps in business, which leaves our people 
a, a, a small pool of, of uh, litigators within which to be able to get or protect their rights before the courts. Um, one thing I'm thinking of is perhaps to be able to use social media in encouraging more uh, people to join uh, the legal profession. The, the medical profession certainly is ratcheting up the, the, the number of doctors that it is uh, producing. Right now, I think we have around 2.5 lawyers for every 1,000 Filipinos. And this is for 2.5, but not all of the 2.5 will be practicing law. Most of them will be, as, as I mentioned earlier, in other fields. So I think to, it would be very helpful for, for uh, in, in utilizing uh, social media, considering the fact that many of our population, 70%, are between, I think, below the age of 35. So they'll be very technically savvy in these, uh, in these cases. So if we could encourage them to participate more, uh, appoint more judges, um, mm. and uh, in, uh, have more lawyers participating in judicial work or in litigation work, I think that will be quite helpful for us. Pareta, how quickly will we see results from your appointment, if and when you're appointed? Your um, uh, short-term plan for the judiciary or, uh, and the uh, long-term plan for the judiciary? The long-term definitely has to do with the, the crafting of jurisprudence and uh, hopefully being able to shape the judiciary into the things that I mentioned earlier. Short term, um, the ones that I answered with regard to Judge Monte de Monteverde's questions earlier and, and what I just mentioned right now before you, um, I, I wouldn't know about any timelines. Uh, it would really depend also on, on my Chief Justice, on, on the assignments that he would also give me. But I would certainly would want to t be proactive about it and, and suggest it and uh, work on it as quickly as I can. Um, but I, I am very mindful of, of the 15-man body. I am going to be, I think, the bunso for the se next couple of years. So, but uh, I, I will do what I can to be able to come up with the, you know, with the, with the programs that I mentioned. Kareta Atoni Villanueva, how are you? Again, question. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, with respect to careerism, uh, no heavy, not having a judicial experience. I'll give you two minutes uh, sale pitch to convince us why you should be chosen among the other applicants. I'll, I'll first address the question on whether it is right that uh, those who are not in the judiciary should also be in the shortlist and therefore taking away uh, the spot that's supposed to be reserved for those who come in from, uh, say, the appellate courts. And My, my personal uh, view, Your Honor, is that in order to, to encourage a career in the judiciary, the priority should be coming appointments to the Supreme Court should be coming really from the Court of Appeals and Digan Bay and all the appellate court. That is the bulk. And therefore, we, we, we try to create a, um, a judicial career path that starts from, that may start from the lowest court up to the Court of Appeals with a dream of uh, one day being in contention for appointment. That is what I have to say. But I also agree with uh, my two gentlemen, uh, Renzo says, that it is important also that even as those coming from the Court of Appeals and Digan Bayan should be first have the crack of being able to fill in, that once in a while we should, uh, the Supreme Court should be, should be uh, filled in from coming from outside because of the strength that that person brings. And uh, in mind, you, you would notice, Your Honor, that we're filling up the vacancies of, of two outstanding uh, associate justices who really came from the private sector without having to having served in uh, the Court of Appeals or Sandigan Bayan uh, or in the judiciary before they they were appointed to the Supreme Court and they have both of them have done outstanding job in being able to, to show how a private sector or non-judiciary career or an, even an academic career can sometimes make whole uh, so to speak the mind of the Supreme Court your honor are we not going to heed to the ruling of the court with respect to those who came from the outside, so young who joined the judiciary, but yet who had been removed from the judiciary? That, that, that happens, Your Honor, not because of their non-judicial career, but I think that that goes into into in each case when that happens that goes into the, the character of the person who, who is there your honor I, I don't think it has it is always necessarily tied up to the fact that they 
were appointed young, too young or that uh, they came uh, not from the judiciary area. Because there are really outstanding uh, people who have served out their, their terms in the Supreme Court uh, where their career as a, as a, a judge uh, began and ended illustriously in the Supreme Court, Your Honor. Arata Ham, the times uh, had been shortlisted three times. Uh, yes, I understand that, Your Honor. Do you think uh, Justice Hip, uh, is yours? No, Your Honor, it's <laughs> always uh, being part of the Supreme Court for me has always been a matter of fate, Your Honor. Uh, that uh, somehow in his mysterious ways, um, our God uh, determines who would be in the Supreme Court uh, at a great way. Many people prepare. Many pe people go to the line, but so, so to speak, only the, the ones that are appointed uh, are handed out by faith. But we keep trying, Your Honor, because none of us really know whether it is us that faith would tap on the shoulder, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Court Ad. Can you describe your leadership style as a court administrator? Uh, Your Honor, um my leadership style is that um, I try to um, be very approachable and accommodating to, to the judges, to my, to my staff. But uh, I know when it is a, uh, I know that there is a line that uh, should not be crossed. And therefore, um, if let's say the request is not in accordance with our policies, with our rules, with our laws, then that request cannot be um, accommodated. In the same manner, if uh, there are some uh, indiscretions or um, irregularities that are being committed, then uh, those should not be allowed to uh, continue or to happen. Um, but uh, I'd like to be very um, accommodating and approachable so that um, I will be able to know what are the real concerns uh, by those in the field and uh, what's really happening uh, um, in the field, Your Honor. How do you move or steer people in the direction you wish? Well, uh, Your Honor, uh, there's only one direction and that is uh, uh, what is right and uh, what is in accordance with our uh, policies, rules and processes, Your Honor. So, um, in going that uh, direction, uh, uh, there is no compromise, Your Honor. And how do you gain, gain their respect? Uh, Your Honor, um, uh, that, uh, if I may, uh, Your Honor, uh, that was uh, one question when I was asked when I was applying for uh, court administrator. Because that, that, that was almost 10 years ago and I was... Uh, considered to be very young uh, to be appointed as court administrator and that question was asked you know, if how do I gain the respect of the judges who are much older than I am and I simply said that uh, I will just show them that I uh, I work and that uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I work and that I will also uh, give them the respect uh, that uh, uh, um, is um, that they should be accorded and I think uh, because of uh, what they see in me and uh, because of uh, my style, then I will be accorded the uh, respect that is uh, necessary for uh, my stature. You know. And uh, why do you want to leave the office of the court administrator? Are you not comfortable? <laughs> Your Honor, um, I've been doing good in the, uh, the OCAD. Your Honor, um, I've been the longest serving court administrator also, uh, almost uh, 10 years already. The one before me, uh, did not even go five years, Your Honor. Um, I think um, um, it's about time that uh, there be a change in uh, leadership in the Office of the Court Administrator, Your Honor. To give others the opportunity to go up also? That is right, Your Honor. <coughs> insistent your deputies. Uh, How insistent are your deputies to that position? How? Even when yeah, you're going to be articulated. Uh, be promoted well well your honors uh, of course uh, the deputy court administrators uh, will be uh, will will have an advantage over the other applicants if that was position will be vacant and of course uh, um, the appointment of a court administrator is left to the 15-man uh, supreme court 
and I would like to think that uh, each and every member of the court would have their own uh, preference, Your Honor. Arata, in your opinion, uh, what are the issues plaguing the judiciary? Your Honor, um, I would still go for the twin uh, evils of uh, congestion and delay, Your Honor. Um, while, um, while in the past uh, few months, we have seen uh, great improvement in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the dockets of, uh, of many of our courts, meaning, uh, um, let's say here in uh, Quezon City or even in uh, Makati, um, the past few years, the court dockets were around 800 to 1,500. Now, we have courts in Makati, Quezon City, and uh, even in Manila with only double figures, 80, 90 cases. No? Uh, but still in other uh, far-flung areas, no? in the provinces, Bogo, uh, in the um, outskirts of Cebu, yeah, also in Cavite, even in, um, in uh, some uh, courts in Bulacan, we still have uh, over, overburdened courts, Your Honor. And if you have an overburdened court, that also equates in uh, delay and uh, resolution of cases because uh, it is just physically impossible for a judge to address or manage 1,500, 2,000 cases. So um, uh, even if he priority prioritizes some of those cases, the other cases will suffer uh, delay, Your Honor. So um, I would still think that the two... Um, uh, most troublesome uh, areas in the, our uh, court system would be uh, um, over congestion of our uh, some courts and uh, which um, <coughs> uh, results in delay your honor but um, if I may be able to relate um, to another uh, to an earlier question I think uh, uh, court automation will uh, solve this uh, problem of congestion in delay to a certain extent and will um, enable the courts to be more uh, efficient your honor we had uh, interviewed the uh, judges, justices, who complained about the turtle pace or snow pace uh, resolution or disposition of administrative cases of judges and justices. To the extent that those who already retired uh, were never uh, yet to receive, had yet to receive their retirement benefits. What's your thought on this? Because they complained that uh, your assistant Deputies, deputies do not stay in the office for so long. Others have a singing engagement, other activities. What can you address to this? Uh, Your Honor, um, the function and the responsibilities of uh, the court administrator together with the uh, deputy court administrators and assistant court administrators are actually very vast. Um, it cannot be that they will be staying in the office um, all the time from 8 to 5 p.m. Um, they really have to uh, go out and uh, um, not necessarily your honor. Uh, in fact, uh, if I may, your honor, that is why uh, I actually was the one who advocated that the, dif the different uh, deputy court administrators will have to be assigned in their respective uh, group of islands, one for Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao so that they can be more accessible by the judges and court personnel in those areas. Um, your, also, Your Honor, um, I think um, the delay uh, I mean, in uh, resolving um, administrative cases um, concerning judges and court personnel um, is not only within the office of the court administrator, Your Honor, because uh, we have a number of cases actually already, or a number of rec uh, recommendations already filed in court, but uh, has remained um, unacted upon. Um, in fact, Your Honor, if I may cite an example, we have a recommendation uh, to the court for uh, an imposition of a sanction against an official which has been pending for maybe five, six years already. And, um, and that official or, uh, is under suspension. So that means uh, we cannot move because uh, and, and that, uh, that, that position cannot be considered vacant because uh, it's still with the court, Your Honor. 
Um, also, Your Honor, um, I think um, we also have to automate our uh, office of uh, officer court administrator so that uh, we can speed up uh, our processes, Your Honor. Uh, these are just some of the things I think that uh, should be done to speed up um, the process in uh, the office of the court administrator, Your Honor. Can you react, uh, Justice Reyes, in due time? No. <laughs> because administrative cases had been delayed, the resolution had been delayed also in the court. Uh, Your Honor, if I may add, I, I've actually been uh, monitoring uh, some, some of these cases, especially those which have been filed in court already for like two, three years. And I've also actually um, uh, requested uh, no less than the Chief Justice. And uh, I think uh, he has already uh, taken this up with uh, those uh, in charge of those uh, cases here. All right, in this stage, there is a, the, the vetting process is uh, as at the Judicial Nominating Committee. They have also this Judicial Monitoring Committee, Monitoring Judges, Justices, Tagala. How about in the court, uh, Office of the Court Administrator? How do you monitor uh, the performance of judges, Tagala? as well as justices. Is it possible or is it feasible to create a committee on monitoring cases, judges? Uh, Your Honor, uh, while um, as court administrator, I have uh, <coughs> I only actually um, monitor our uh, first and second level court judges unless the Supreme Court uh, directs me or instructs me to also look, look into our uh, third level courts no while um, while um, the law creating the office of the court administrator says that it has a it has a supervision over all lower courts meaning lower courts lower than the supreme court i um, i give um, um, i, I uh, defer to the presiding uh, justices of the uh, appellate court, the third level court. So I only um, uh, monitor and supervise second, first and second level courts. Now, they can be monitored because all our courts are supposed to submit monthly reports. And those monthly reports will indicate um, their clearance rate, disposition rate, and uh, that is where they can be monitored. Of course, if they do not submit uh, monthly reports that will also show no? and therefore um, when we when the court administrator is asked to re recommend who the next executive judge or vice executive judges will be then we look at all these uh, data uh, of course we also take into consideration uh, the reputation of the judges and uh, the years of uh, service of our judges your honor and of course, um, the court administrator sits as a uh, as a <coughs> consultant of the JBC. So when the court administrator is asked about cert, uh, reputations of certain judges uh, who are um, vying for a promotion, then uh, we have also some uh, um, data on those, Your Honor. All right. Uh, what have you done professionally? That is not an experience you would want to repeat. You're now a bachelor again? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, but professionally? Going through another set of interviews before the JBC, Your Honor? <laughs> you will not want to repeat this again. <laughs> uh, well, Your Honor, um, Professionally, Your Honor, um, professionally, Your Honor, as court administrator, I, uh, I um, go to our, uh, go to the lower courts. Um, what I don't want really to, go <laughs> to repeat would be going to the families of our uh, judges and uh, condoling with them because we have a judge who was a, uh, killed or uh, 
shot uh, while in the service. No? Uh, that happened uh, very recently, Your Honor, um, <clears throat> when I had to travel to uh, Dipolog. And uh, that was uh, really very un uh, unfortunate, Your Honor. Arata Tony Gatdula, my last question to you. If you could invent something, what could it be and why? Before I answer that, uh, can I answer what professional thing I do not want to repeat? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, when I made a mistake in the is thing. <laughs> in, the, in the letter that you corrected. <laughs> um, but with regard to the inven uh, invention, uh, per per perhaps a, a Perhaps a device that will be able to allow to tell us the consequences of the decisions that we make. Um, the problem with a lot of the legislations that we, I mean, if, even on a personal level, but at the same time with regard to legislation and also with regard to the judicial decisions, we all have the best of intent. The problem is, is that uh, the law of unintended consequences keep applying. So perhaps uh, offhand, that's the, that's the one device I'd like to see. Um, there have been a lot of laws that were made uh, with the best of intentions, hoping to cure poverty, hoping to make people's lives better. For ex one big example is the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson. But in the end, after all the billions of money spent, people still remain in poverty. Racial divide is still there. And um, so perhaps a, a device that could offer us a, a, a glimpse of the unintended consequences would be quite helpful. Um, that's it, Your Honor. Let's vote for Tony Gadul in the next election. All right, uh, Dean uh, Cesar Villanueva, what will you do differently if you knew no one would judge you? In my life, in my professional life, Your Honor? Uh, even in your unprofessional life. Today. Right, in my life, no one would judge me. I'd probably be um, spend more time with my family, my grandchildren, uh, uh, and and make up for all the lost time trying to build a career, because trying to build a career is one of the things that you you begin to feel well because of the uh, uh, honor that uh, and praise that society will heap upon you. Therefore, uh, if uh, society's judgment were not important on how successful one's career would be. I would spend those times with my family, being a better husband, a better father, a better grandfather, and then uh, spending whatever time I, I, I have uh, trying to help the, uh, those in my community, basically. Th that's it. Uh, trying to be invisible except to those who consider who, who are most important in my life, Your Honor. Ara, right, thank you, gentlemen, and uh, good luck again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Judge Honorable Judge Toribio E. Ilo Jr. representing the private sector. The next to conduct the panel interview is the Honorable Justice Noel Jimenez Tiham, regular member representing the Akadim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. I have been listening intently to the questions and the answers you gave. Uh, there are some sectors who advocate that nominations of judges should be tossed back to the commission on appointments. Are you in favor of uh, abolishing the JBC for asking difficult questions and administering intensive examinations and uh, are you in favor of that uh, attorney Gatdula? I, I admit when I first uh, saw the provisions of the 87 constitution um, that it perhaps is a an innovation that uh, is more cosmetic than than real, but through practice, and I'm not saying this because I'm before you guys, 
but but the fact that um, when we see the experience that is happening in the US which wherein judges are before the commission appointments and the fact that the nomination process the confirmation process has become incredibly politicized uh, is sometimes even very virulently so I think there is a merit to be said for the creation of the JBC. Um, th one considers that when nominations are made to the ICJ, it goes to the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which essentially works in the same way that the JBC uh, process does it. Uh, and one final thing I'd like to, uh, and it just occurred to me uh, because of the questions of Judge Ilao and, and Judge De Monteverde with regard to the qualifications of, of uh, Supreme Court justices. Uh, of course, I, I, uh, I am in favor of having a wider pool or uh, sourcing it from a wider pool. But it also occurred to me that the members of the JBC reflect that need for a wider pool. Not all members of the JBC essentially come from the judiciary. And so I think that knowing that, knowing that some come from the legislative branch, knowing that some come from the private sector, the academe, and uh, also the executive branch, I think... Um, is, is in a way reflective and bodes well for the appointment of judges uh, whose job is perhaps narrower but as equally as important but at the same time focused on looking at the legality or constitutionality of laws uh, rather than policy which the other two branches uh, uh, are uh, mandated to, to do. So that's my answer. You, know. you made the novel suggestion that probably this time it is better to nominate people more from the private sector and probably give premium to younger people who would be in a position to stay in the court for a reasonable period of time to mold the direction of the court Will that not militate against judicial careerism and the aspiration of people in the judiciary to go up the judicial ladder? Um, no, Your Honor, I made that co a comment in the context of a uh, judiciary right now and a Supreme Court right now that is already, the bulk of it is already made up of members of uh, the, ju uh, the judiciary, whether it be the Court of Appeals, Court of Tax Appeals, uh, uh, Sandigan Bayan. Um, what, what I was merely suggesting is perhaps there could be a slot, a couple, three perhaps or something, to at least provide some sort of variety in the, in the getting of insights. But, uh, but if, 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 if you don't mind my, my um, uh, clarifying my remark, Your Honor, I did not say to give a premium to those who are outside the judiciary. I, I, I merely said it in the context of giving balance or perhaps additional insights to the bulk of the people who are in the Supreme Court who already came from the judiciary. Um, with regard again to my comment with, uh, in the appointment of younger people to the Supreme Court, again that is made in the context that a bulk of the appointments made to the, to the Supreme Court um, would be coming from the 60, 65 year range or perhaps even 55 onwards and so uh, perhaps there could also be a uh, in the same way that the Senate has a, is always a standing body perhaps there could be something said uh, that for a Supreme Court wherein fresh blood keeps coming in and out uh, whatever the age there's still fresh blood coming in and out of the body but there will be at least a couple of constant presences there that will, will hopefully be uh, uh, a source of insight then for all the new members that would come in uh, to the court. So in the end, what we're talking of here is a variety of experiences and, in, in, and, and insights and, and, uh, and expertises, rather than giving a premium to this or that group or, or what have you. Uh, as a final comment, I actually wrote an article once on the retirement of, uh, Chief Just, uh, of Justice Natura, uh, who I've co-written a, a book on, on public international law. And one of the things I've actually mentioned is that perhaps considering the, 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 the health, the, the vigor of many of the people who retire from the judiciary, which is pegged at 70, perhaps a, a case should be made um, rather than the pending legislation that has been suggested right now, I think in the Senate, wherein the retirement ages are made lower, 
uh, that the retirement ages actually be either increased or, or be made higher because we're, we're losing a lot of a, a huge amount of experience for people in the judiciary that just when they're getting their stride then they have to retire already because of the fact that they hit 70. You have people, for example, like Florentino Feliciano, who would serve on for almost several more years uh, in, in the World Trade Organization and had he be given a chance in the ICJ. You had also Cesar Bengson and the others. So I think um, there, there, should, there could be a case made not only for appointing younger people, but at the same time letting um, m the more senior people to stay in the court for a longer period of time. Uh, court Administrator Maidas, you have been consultant of the JBC. You have sat uh, during the JBC deliberations. You have been interviewed uh, before the JBC. What suggestions can you make to make the screening process more objective, more judicious, more impartial? Um, well, um, what I uh, noticed or observed in the JBC, not only in the present uh, JBC, but uh, even in the past uh, JBCs, is that, um, let's say, uh, when an applicant for a first level or second level court is, uh, is um, interviewed, then there is only one uh, there is only one um, member who interviews the applicant we we have <clears throat> we have discarded that practice already so with respect to applicants for the first level and second level we started uh, a few weeks ago to conduct a a panel interview as well uh, uh, thank you your honor but Again, um, well, of course, uh, that will have uh, that will have its uh, pros and cons because if we will be, if uh, a panel will be required to interview first and second lo uh, level court applicants, then that will take too much time of the members, no? Uh, because as we know, there are so many um, applicants um, for for vacant courts, no? But anyway, your honor, um, what I know this is that. Um, when uh, after the interview, when it's already um, voting no? or uh, for the shortlist, uh, there is not much uh, discussion on the, a particular uh, uh, individual who is being um, 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 nominated to be to to um, be included in the shortlist. We we have already made innovations in that. So the practice right now is before the voting on the shortlist, uh, we extensively discuss the individual merits of the applicants. Yeah, maybe your honor for, for the regular members, uh, uh, that can be said, but um, we, we have uh, three other members who are um, in the, um, sitting in, uh, in their uh, official capacities or, uh, because of their uh, respective positions. And, um, I don't think they are able to participate in um, in the deliberations of the regular members. Should should the names of people recommending applicants be given due weight? Are they important? Are they to be considered as assets or liabilities? Well, I think. Uh, I. I your Honor, you mean the, um, the one, the, the member when, of the JBC? When, when an applicant for a judgeship submits his application letter, in the PDS, it is normally stated there, references. Is it important to find out whether the persons recommending them are, are likewise credible? In other words, uh, Recommendation by politicians, for example, uh, big business people who might have ultimately cases in the court, are those recommendations more of liabilities than assets? 
I, I think, Your Honor, it will be it will depend on the particular uh, individual uh, um, being named as reference or that individual who is recommending. Um, and of course, um, <clears throat> of course, if I were the applicant and I would put a certain name there, then I would have chosen that applicant, uh, that uh, recommend that recommender, to be someone of stature, someone who is respected, and someone who would be giving a uh, a good account of my of my uh, accomplishments and uh, my capabilities. No, uh, again, that would depend. That would. Uh, that would depend on the members of the JBC, and uh, perhaps later, if the JBC is not um, is not um, sure of um, about a certain applicant, then that's a time maybe the JBC can um, call on these uh, individuals uh, giving the recommendation. But I think um, it should be also considered by the JBC. Uh, Dean Villanueva. You were making some discussions on the bar examinations. Are grades in the bar examinations, should grades in the bar examinations of, of applicants for judgeship be given more premium? And should applicants who took the bar once be given more preference than somebody who took it twice? Human nature is it is your honor. The grades in the bar exam, especially for those who top the, the bar exams, do impress people, whether in the JBC or not. But in the end, your honor, it's, it's what they do uh, with their license to practice law that is more important to consider. And, and therefore, this answers the question, should those who took the bar exam only once as against those who took it two or three times be given a premium? The answer is, uh, no, you know, human nature as it is, it is our role to rise up even beyond where we are. In fact, it is those who have uh, fallen and are able to rise that prove to be uh, better equipped to solve uh, society's problems than those who have always been constantly uh, uh, champions. So I think that aside from the fact that they do have a good start, by the time they are before the JBC, they would have had a career since they took the bar exams. And therefore, how they did... Uh, with, with the illustrious grades that they have or how they were able to rise above uh, having to take it uh, several times is the more important consideration because that would show the metal of the, man, uh, of the person and show to us how, how much uh, they appreciate uh, society's fervor always trying to rise up above certain norms, Your Honor. Uh, based on your experience and information, do lawyers who excelled academically on the average make better lawyers and better judges? To the extent that, uh, the answer is not always the same, Your Honor. Um, to the extent that high grades, or those who win Latin honors, uh, or achieve Latin honors, those are just a manifestation as a certain discipline the way they look at life. In other words, they achieve those not because because of the discipline that they have, and they carry that, that becomes a second nature to that, and they, they carry that whether in practice or, in, uh, uh, or when they become judges. And therefore, to a great extent, uh, many of them do. In fact, the two, the two justices, uh, retiring justices today, uh, who, who are, uh, whose uh, pos uh, seats, uh, positions we are replacing, indicate that they're two brilliant uh, scholars uh, of the law, who have proven well in both their practice, but to, to every brilliant person who, uh, academically, there are others who, uh, because they concentrated more on uh, EQ and the relationship with people, of understanding how people react in certain circumstances, they're also uh, effective. In fact, they become more effective in the sense that they have a feel on how the average Filipino uh, feels and reacts, Your Honor. Attorney Gadula, in the evaluation of applicants for judgeship, which is more important, skills or attitude? Uh, 
I would have I would have wanted to answer integrity, but if it's limited to skills and attitude, I would probably limit it. I would probably, and if the choice is necessarily binary, I have to choose uh, attitude. Um, can you you can teach skills, yes, but you cannot teach attitude. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and I would define attitude as including the curiosity to keep on learning, um, the uh, the charity to be able to look at people as people rather than merely numbers or statistics, and so on and so forth. So yes, attitude, Your Honor. Can you give me what uh, human values you profess? in your, both in your personal and professional life? Uh, loyalty uh, to my friends, loyalty to the cause or to the oath that I've taken. Um, honesty to the point that even, for example, uh, people are not there or not watching the fact that I did something I know that I should not have done, I mean, if other people don't know it, but I know it, I know that I shouldn't have done it. Uh, and at the same time, always, and above all, I think, uh, I wouldn't know if it's uh, a value, but I would say love. Um, somebody once asked me before, why do I keep doing the things that we do? Uh, and and uh, uh, Dean Villanueva actually gave a very poignant answer to one of the questions earlier. If, if there was really nothing, no judgments to be made, perhaps it would be really far better to just disappear and be one of among the many people who are leading quiet lives. But the thing is that we were given talents and we were given the opportunity, the experiences, uh, and we were given the opportunity to rise. And so perhaps um, out of love, the need to be able to do well for the country, for other people, obviously for our families, is there. So this is not an easy thing that we're doing right now. The fact that we have to submit all these documents and the fact that we have to undergo all these grillings. The interesting thing here is that because of the questions that were raised, um, I'm pretty guessing that a fair amount of coverage will probably be made and scrutiny be made upon all of us here who are applicants. These are things that normal people do not go through. But we do it because out of love for the things that we've, we value and we hope to uphold. So uh, um, that, that's it, Your Honor. That's, that's my response. Uh, Court Administrator Maidas, in your dealings with judges nationwide, what impresses you most? Skills or attitude? Attitude, Your Honor. Um, attitude uh, because I think... Uh, Judges should always be uh, constantly or consistently motivated to do uh, their work, to resolve their cases uh, um, at the most uh, uh, within the within, within the period uh, required, or if not even uh, a shorter period. And um, the skills uh, they can be learned. Um, through their uh, continuing judicial education and in the lectures that uh, they are um, attending, Your Honor. Apart from the enumeration made by Attorney Gaddula, what human values do you practice in your personal as well as professional life? Attorney Gaddula mentioned loyalty, honesty, and uh, what's the other thing? Love. Charity, love. Uh, Your Honor, if I may um, just briefly, uh, I'd like to say also loyalty. I think um, my um, almost 30 years of service in the Supreme Court um, says so much about it. Um, instead of, um, <clears throat> well, um, honesty or integrity also, I think uh, because of my long years in the court, um, I've been in the... Um, uh, serving different um, chief justices, I think um, I will not be still here if uh, I have not uh, practiced integrity. And also, Your Honor, I'd like to add um, industry, Your Honor. Uh, I think uh, my work ethic is uh, something that um, I have uh, maintained since uh, 
uh, day one as a court administrator or even when I was a law clerk uh, working for uh, the various uh, justices, Your Honor. Uh, Dean Villanueva, the same question. Uh, human values which are dear to your heart and which human value would you consider paramount? I think the uh, unique human value of being able to feel and express love, Your Honor. It's a value that we share with, I think, with God. He's, he so loved the world that He gave up His only Son to, to save us all. It is that human uh, ability to love like no other animal on earth uh, that makes us closer to Him, that love for, for the knowledge that makes us uh, stay out at night and, and read and find the truth, that love for our uh, family and our fellow beings that make us become martyrs and, and choose death in order to, to protect them. And uh, the love for everything that makes uh, life wonderful, uh, that, uh, that allows many of us to try to preserve the, the environment. I think that's the most important virtue that man possesses that makes him so different uh, and so different from in this universe, I, I believe you're on. Attorney Gadula, is mental health important in selecting judges? Have you come across in your practice from experience, observation, and even information? Are there judges who exhibit erratic or aberrant attitude or erratic behavior? Uh, well, to your, to, to your last question, the answer is yes, I have. Um, to your first question, is mental health important? One would like to give chances to some people, to people who have been unfortunately been given certain um, condition, mental conditions that, uh, that is really beyond their choosing. There could be some, if there could be found a way, for example, for uh, th these people who can still function professionally to work, uh, persons, for example, who may be autistic or maybe dyslexic or what have you, there's no reason to disqualify them for a job if, if in the end they could function as properly as, as they can. Um, with regard, but if you're talking of the, the whole package of mental health uh, and, and in relation to the Supreme Court, the one thing that, that, that pops into my mind is the fact that the Supreme Court acts as a body, acts as a collegial body. Uh, nobody is supposed to uh, go about and moonlight on his own or her own and uh, starts acting as if his or her actions would be the actions of the body. Uh, I, and the reason why I know this and I value the collegiality aspect is because of the work I do at UANP right now. UANP, the UANP structure all, always operates as a collegial body. We never appoint, for example, dean and then um, sub-deans and what have you. Every, above every official would be a body, a committee, which is called the Operations Committee. And then the overall uh, operations of the university is by way of a management committee. So even the president, for example, of the university is just in primus inter pares, just one among the many. Every decision that is made is always collegially done. And for almost a decade now, that's the work I have been doing, which is to try, as a, sec as a secretary of the committee, I, I try to bring each and every differing opinions, temperaments, and so that we can work together and come up with a, with a decision that hopefully um, addresses most of the concerns. From the outside, it looks inefficient. And from the outside, it looks slow. But when one trusts the institution, one trusts the collegial aspect of it, and if one trusts also the other members, um, it works incredibly well. And in all the years I've been working from, from the multinational, from the international consultancies and the law firms I've, I've been in, um, the collegial aspect of UANP is, is actually incredibly fascinating to watch. Uh, and that's how I essentially view the Supreme Court as well. Don't, you don't see nothing intrinsically wrong to have a Supreme Court uh, populated by sane people psychologically aberrant people, people with anxiety, people with anger management problems. What I'm saying is the question, the fundamental question is, is mental health important for the JBC to vet and screen applicants to the judiciary? 
Ult ultimately, yes, Your Honor. Uh, it, 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 is, it is... And you mentioned that mm -hmm. uh, you have personal experience of judges exhibiting uh, aberrant or erratic behavior. What, what for example? Um, of course, without naming names, like for example, when I was first practicing law, I remember of a judge here in the Metro Manila who would actually have an, a frying pan beside her uh, 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 chair and immediately, and she would just, I'm sorry I mentioned the gender, but she would uh, just rant on and rant on against all the litigants and then after that start cooking breakfast immediately right there in the sala. I think that pretty much qualifies as one. And, and there are others as well, uh, up to varying degrees. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, hopefully it could be avoided. It's one of those things that you see from the movie of Al Pacino and Justice for All. You see some judges that are a little bit eccentric. Um, but in the end, uh, if... Uh, I mean, if, as long as, if it could not, would not detract from the dignity of the law and it would not take away from the rights of the parties, if it's possible to allow such members of the judiciary to, to be there, then perhaps it, it, should, it should be fine. The problem is the Supreme Court is a different matter. It requires different competencies and it requires the ability to work within a group. And the fact that there's also a managerial aspect to the Supreme Court because of the fact that it also administers other personnel um, requires a higher level of mental health. So um, if you're talking here of, of deliberating, we all have certain degrees of depression, we all have certain degrees of anxiety, but if it's going to be to a level of deliberating the person to properly function as a person and then within the group, I don't think it should be, I, I don't think that should be allowed. So. Uh, Dean Villanueva, <clears throat> mental health in the judiciary. Now let's talk of the Supreme Court. Will it be an important factor during the deliberation of cases, the mental health status of members in the judiciary? I, would, it, would it be a, a factor in the deliberating process or even in the lower courts? Will it have any connection to the judicious disposition of cases, evaluation, making decisions? Yes, Your Honor, I believe it does. And I think it's important for the JBC to consider mental health as one of the factors to qualify a judge because uh, for somebody who's not in good mental health, uh, then what is the rule of, reason, rule of law? How can it abide, Your Honor? Um, to somebody who's, uh, who's crazy, Your Honor, uh, then reason has no meaning because they cannot understand reasoning. So I think it's important. And, when the, lives, uh, when the lives of men and women and uh, their future and their career or, and their property are in the hands of a decision by the judge or, uh, uh, or by a court, then uh, and, and the, the fate of a nation hangs in the hands of a decision, uh, then who will, how can a, a, ju a judge or a justice who does not know what is reasonable and not reasonable cannot distinguish what is uh, true and fantastic, we cannot expect uh, justice to flow from that. And the uh, erosion of uh, public uh, regard for this dispensation of justice goes down eventually, Your Honor. So I think that's it's so, it's so quite important. Uh, Court Administrator Maidas, you, you have encountered lots of uh, judges with mental quirks. What steps have you taken or has the court taken to address these concerns, considering that the vetting of the psychological profile of judges is done by the JBC at the time of uh, screening and vetting, but once appointed, how do you monitor the mental status of judges? And if you come across a situation where a particular judge has psychological, mental problems that will affect the performance of the work of that judge. Can you remove or sanction the judge? Uh, Your Honor, <coughs> uh, you're correct that uh, our judges only go through that uh, process of uh, evaluating their uh, mental condition whenever 
they apply uh, first or for apply for uh, promotions uh, before the JBC because on a regular basis uh, the court does not um, uh, subject them to regular uh, uh, monitoring of uh, their mental conditions. It will only uh, come to fore when um, let's say a complaint or a report, a complaint is filed against them or a report is uh, uh, sent to the office of the court administrator when uh, we can um, we can um, uh, do something no? uh, so we and um, um, looking into the mental health of an incumbent uh, first level or second level court judge is actually very sensitive no? that we will to my view I will have to um, uh, recommend to the court that this particular uh, magistrate be subjected to uh, psychological evaluation and examination um, so we, we can only do that if let's say there's um, a complaint filed against a judge or reports uh, coming to my office that would uh, require or necessitate uh, these uh, kinds of um, monitoring and evaluation uh, Dean Villanueva as somebody from the academe if appointed to the court During deliberation in the court, what would you do to endeavor to teach the other members of the court to have a complete and a thorough analysis of the merits of the case? And uh, connected to that, if you are unsuccessful in encouraging them, to your side, which do you think is more challenging, being in the majority or being alone or being in the minority? In that occasion, Your Honor, I would not actually try to teach uh, the members of the tribunal uh, simply because they probably have more to teach me uh, being new. What I would do is to convince them of the merits of the points by participating in a very respectful way in the deliberation, uh, showing to them by the sheer worth and merit of the arguments and why they would consider this. And in the end, it's up to them to, to, to accept them. And my success in being able to convince them uh, is, is based on the merits of my arguments. And in fact, if I am unable to convince them uh, through the sheer uh, merits and, uh, of my argument, then I must look at my, my own position. Uh, and consider their consideration. That's what a collegial body should do. But in the end, Your Honor, I am unable to convince them so that, uh, uh, that I, I, and I still believe in the position I stand for. Then it becomes my solemn duty then to write a very respectful dissenting opinion, to, to try to, to show the basis of why I think this should be it. And, and a dissenting opinion, once it's published, uh, not only speaks to the public, it also speaks to the justices themselves because having gone out there in public consumption, they begin to, uh, intelligent people as we are all, uh, an argument, even if we don't accept, begins to churn in our mind. And when that same thing happens, therefore, that dissenting opinion becomes like a clarion call. And perhaps in, on that day, they begin to believe that. But rather than teaching them, I don't think that's my position, Your Honor. Attorney Gadula, the same question. You're also in the academe. You'd like to be persuasive. You try. You want to influence uh, the court. What steps will you take? And if you are uns unsuccessful, will you be disappointed if most of the time you're always in the minority? Um, essentially, the same answers that Dean Villanueva gave. I'm not going to presume that the members of the court uh, uh, is for me to to uh, teach. I'm definitely going to be learning a lot from them. All of us are essentially all experts in the law when we come to the court already. And all of us will have predetermined, solid, reasoned philosophies already with regard to, to uh, the judiciary. Um, I'll, I'll do it the, the, the same way I've been doing for the past uh, two decades. And that is to be able to present my case as clearly and as logically and as cohesively as possible. Um, I would try to show uh, the, the, the positive aspects of the case, try to see if they're common ground, 
And if there's if there are no common grounds, then perhaps I'll I'll just write uh, the reasons why I have to give my my separate opinions. Um, frankly, it doesn't really bother me if I'm in the major. It doesn't really matter for me if I'm in the majority or in the minority. Uh, I think what is always important is to be able to use a biblical term to to give witness. If I think that really truly inside me that this is the correct thing to do, um, if if it is something that my colleagues disagree with. I have nothing against that, but it's something I think that I should be able to put on the record so that if ever, years from now, um, people could take a second look and perhaps see the merit. Um, if I may add, this is just a point of interest for me, Your Honor, with regard to your question on mental health. And uh, it just occurred to me that when I was thinking about the rulings made, particularly on the Coaranto case, uh, on, the, on, on the removal of Supreme Court justices, there's a little known provision that we usually overlook, and that is the fact that Supreme Court justices are supposed to remain in good behavior until 70. I think it's a provision that we should pr probably try to look at and examine, particularly in relation to the question that you raised, which is in on mental health. The two branches of government, the executive branch could essentially be removed because of the, for example, the executive branch because of the cabinet voting against the president, or uh, housekeeping made by members of Congress against one of their own for, for a, a act that they feel is unworthy of the House or the Senate. The Supreme Court is the only one who perhaps right now, I think, is refraining from making a resolution based on the actions of one of their members. But I think on that provision of law, perhaps a reason can be made to study on whether or not a, a justice of the Supreme Court who, who may have been doing something that is less than uh, befitting the Supreme Court that the other 14 members could perhaps make a call upon. Uh, court Admidas. How will you be able to, if you if appointed to the court, how would you be able to influence the other members of the court, considering that you have worked for them for many years, and in effect, you work for them. You are the subordinate of these uh, justices of the Supreme Court. Will you defer to their judgment and wisdom, considering that you are a loyal person and? You have been trained for many years to follow orders. Uh, not necessarily, Your Honor. Um, I will argue on the strength of my uh, position um, in, a, in a very uh, respectful ma manner. Um, if I see wisdom in their position, then I, that uh, will make me agree, then I will agree in those uh, certain issues. But uh, definitely, Your Honor, if I have a if I have a position that I've uh, really, uh, really studied and in fact, and even uh, perhaps based on my experience, I think my position is the better position. Then I will um, uh, respectfully argue my position and uh, try to convince the other uh, members of the court. If I uh, fail, then uh, like uh, what uh, Dean Villanueva said, then I will uh, submit or turn in my uh, dissenting opinion, Your Honor. All right. Those are my last questions. Uh, thank you and good luck. Thank you, uh, Honorable Justice Noel Jimenez Tiham, a former colleague of mine in the Court of Appeals, and representing as a legal member the Academy. The next uh, interviewer in our panel interview is the Honorable Justice Jose Catral Mendoza, also a colleague of mine in the Court of Appeals and is the chairperson of the JBC Executive Committee and regular member representing the retired members of the Supreme Court. Good morning. Uh, my first question is addressed to Dean Villanueva. Can you repeat your definition of processual presumption? Uh, my understanding, I said, Your Honor, was that it's uh, um, in any issue raised that the rules and proceedings provided for by law have not been followed as to deny a person of procedural due process, then the presumption is that they were, and it's up to the person who says that they have not been followed where the burden of proof lies to prove that they indeed were not followed. Uh, Tony Gatdula, you are a professor of law and author in international law. Do you agree with that? his understanding? It's in the field of international law, where you passed earlier. You are an author of a book, and you <laughs> teach international law. Yes, Your Honor. 
but uh, at this particular case, I'm drawing a blank, and uh, I, I instinctively think that uh, the defini there's something else to the definition. Uh, right now, it's just escaping me. Um, so, inkling? Uh, I was very tempted to look at the Wi-Fi, but uh, no. Uh, right now, it's not covered in your book. Uh, it's there are a lot of things covered in my book, Your Honor. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I take a pass for, for now. Yeah. Uh, court at my desk, uh, you have an idea now? What is a processual presumption? Yes, Your Honor. And I, I tend to agree with uh, Dina Villanueva on the uh, definition. Yeah. Well, processor presumptions, in the absence of proof, the presumption is that a foreign law is the same as the law of the forum. I knew that. I knew that. If you even wrote it. I address this to uh, Tony Gabula. Earlier you, you were asked what decisions do you disagree with and you mentioned uh, the decision on the RH law and you do not agree on that the issue should be when life begins. Did you read it carefully? Well, yes, sir. Uh, well, I, I'd like to think yes, Your Honor. Was uh, that an issue there? Um, well, it was made an issue and also one of the big portions of the discussion on the oral arguments, Your Honor. It was not made an issue. You read the footnote. The colleagues agreed that it should not be made an issue, but each can uh, touch on the subject and say uh, and write what they think when life begins. It was not an issue. Um, yes, Your Honor. Um, what else? What decisions do you disagree with? To the RH law? Or? No, other ah. other decisions of the Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, if I, if I may go back to the RH, the only reason why I made a reference to the when life begins is because that's the one that got the most airplay. Um, my, my, my true beef with it is that despite the fact that it discussed a lot of things, and, and correctly, it discussed a lot of things uh, with regard to freedom of expression, also with regard to the right of religion, um, the fact that it did not cover, I think, the one crucial aspect, which is the subsidization of, of contraceptives. That's one. Uh, and also another one that I, fi I think I disagree with would be the disregard on the uh, relevance of natural law into the discussion. I, I think um, yes, the yes. fact How that... How do you define natural law? Uh, it's the objective it's standard. covered in several of your articles and books. Uh, it's the objective standard of right and wrong that man derives from the use of his reason on, uh, on proceeding from his human nature. Uh, and and the, only, the only reason why I brought up the, the, the reason with regard to natural law is because the Supreme Court itself has, on its own, uh, made reference to natural law on a number of, of decisions before. And, and the position there is that if there is a positive law, do you still apply natural law? Uh, the argument that we made there is that since the Constitution itself did not mention anything about contraceptives, then perhaps something could be found to be able to provide guidance on whether a contraceptive is a proper uh, subject for the, for the giving of, of uh, uh, tax subsidies. Was and it not defined in our laws, contraceptives? No, the Constitution, Your Honor. No, 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 no the, uh, the laws, the laws. Not the Constitution. Uh, no, but precisely, Your Honor, what I was um, arguing is that since the RH law provided for, con for contraceptives, but the Constitution itself was silent on contraceptives. Yes, we agree that the Constitution is silent. Uh -huh. No problem about that. Uh, you have covered natural law in so many of your writings. What are the basic principles of natural law? How many? And what are they? Essentially, there are two basic principles. One is that a man has a human nature that is uh, definable. And the consequences of that nature uh, is something that we can uh, essentially determine by the use of our reason. 
now to aid us in being able to determine what would be the consequences of human nature there are several uh, inclinations of man and those seven inclinations usually fall into the following life procreation sociability education culture uh, political association and friendships and so from there uh, we we begin to see whether or not certain actions are in accordance with reason or not um, ultimately looking at the ability of a human being to be able to achieve human flourishing um, the common good essentially is related to natural law in the sense that the common good is a system designed to allow human beings to achieve that human flourishing on their own to, to be the best person that a, a person can, uh, can be um, a lot of our natu a lot of natural law is actually already embodied in our legislation mostly in article 3 of the constitution uh, quite famously in the Ten Commandments in the Bible as well. Uh, but a lot of it is essentially in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the brain, Your Honor. It's how we look at a certain circumstance and then use our reasoning to come to certain conclusions. So, depends upon uh, the upbringing of an individual, his values, like that? Uh, no, Your so Honor. So, it's uh, for every individual... Uh, there is uh, a certain natural law um, for human beings itself there is a natural law that applies to all of us because human nature is the same for everybody yes okay. so um, but do you agree what is your definition of right and wrong may be different with the definition by your neighbor okay you agree oh. are you aspiring now as a supreme court justice do you know that uh, no, the Supreme Court justice has adjudicatory and administrative functions? Do you know uh, the administrative problems of the Supreme Court? How would you address them? Uh, Any specific uh, administration? Yes, because you are applying. Have you read the internal laws of, uh, rules of the Supreme Court? Uh, not recently. Uh, no. So, okay. so how would you help in improving it? Um, the Supreme Court. First thing I'll do is I'll read it <laughs> again. But uh, so, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Are, are we leaving already the questions from the natural law? Or have you changed already? Yes, I changed. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay. Oh, because uh, okay. I know your I know your writings. Sorry. Okay. So we uh, I went to the Supreme Court because you are aspiring to be a justice. What reforms do you intend to introduce? Um, actually, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, and I, I agree with uh, Court Administrator Marquez, he actually framed it better than I did, and that is to look at the delay and, and delay and the full dockets. That is why I was uh, talking about earlier for the full implementation of respect for judicial hierarchy, uh, because of the fact that I think there should there's a lot of potential for the Court of Appeals to be able to take away a lot from the load of the Supreme Court. As Do you I, as think I, uh, the case of Gio Sama? Uh, does not answer the problem. Samar, are you familiar with Gio Samar case? Uh, uh, no, Your Honor, sorry. Mm -hmm. Tony Marquez, uh, are you familiar with the Gio Samar case? Uh, no, Your Honor, I'm sorry. You're not familiar with the Gio Samar case? Maybe I just missed the, the, the title. Filtration approach. Filtration approach. Filtration, filtration. Uh -oh. I, I thought it was a giveaway question. <laughs> In the past, uh, there were... Uh, what is the most cited reason for the delay? in the resolution of administrative cases. You mean um, by, by the court, Your Honor, or by the Office of the Court Administrator? The whole process. Well, uh, the most cited reason for the delay, I think, 
of uh, these cases is because uh, uh, the sheer volume of uh, cases be, uh, pending in a certain uh, tribunal, Your Honor. With you or with the Supreme Court? With your office or the Supreme Court? Um, I think uh, both, Your Honor, because uh, that um, the process. In your level, what what is the problem in your level? Uh, in, in in our level, Your Honor, when a when a complaint is uh, filed um, against a judge or a court personnel, it goes to our legal office, and then the legal office will evaluate, will. Um, will uh, give a recommendation on whether or not to dismiss the case or to um, um, or to let's say if uh, if uh, the, the the complaint is sufficient in form and substance then a comment may be required so we require the judge to comment sometimes it will take some time before the comment is received by the by the office and then after the comment is uh, submitted the legal office will again um, uh, evaluate the complaint against the comment and then will give a recommendation. That recommendation will go to the deputy court administrator or assistant court administrator in charge of that area and then it will go to the court administrator. Um, so Lee, uh, from uh, the filing up to your resolution, how many, how many months? Resolution meaning, Your Honor, the recommendation given to the. Um, normally, Your Honor, that would that should take around four to five months. Uh, sometimes it's longer because sometimes uh, the comment of the judge is not uh, submitted right away, and the judge will ask for a extension of time to submit a comment. But in some instances, also, Your Honor, we do not require the judge anymore to comment if we think that the, the complaint on its face is um, our harassment, is judicial in nature, has no merit at all, then we make the recommendation right away to the court that the uh, complaint be dismissed for uh, the reasons uh, aforementioned, Your Honor. Uh, how about in the Supreme Court? What is your experience? Uh, Justice Anders is, is listening. Your Honor, uh, we have uh, actually uh, varying experiences with the court. It depends actually on uh, to whom that uh, case is uh, raffled, Your Honor. So, and also uh, we have also varying experiences um, in in many in in many cases. Uh, whenever we give, uh, when, when, whenever uh, we submit a recommendation for the for the um, uh, dismissal of the complaint without requiring the judge to comment, uh, that recommendation is uh, approved. But um, in some instances, uh, that recommendation is uh, is uh, not um, not um, accepted, and uh, the court, the Supreme Court, will still require the judge to comment. In the past. Uh, an administrative case or a complaint can be dismissed by the office of the court administrator if there is no probable cause. It's not recommend to the Supreme Court, but on its own dismisses the case. Do you want to return to that practice? Uh, that was actually, Your Honor, uh going to be adopted by uh, the late Chief Justice Corona. Uh, and um, if, let's say, the complaint to the, um, to the view of the court administrator should be dismissed, then the court administrator, uh, the power to dismiss that complaint is being delegated to the court administrator. However, um, and if, let's say, uh, it will only go up to the Supreme Court if, let's say, uh, the dismissal by the court administrator. Um, if, if there is a motion for recommendation, a motion for reconsideration on the dismissal made by the court administrator, then that's a the time it will go up to the court. However, that uh, that uh, procedure was not um, 
eventually adopted because uh, of uh, many other um, circumstances intervened during that time. And it was never uh, brought again uh, um, to the court, Your Honor. What is your position on in that regard? I think uh, that will uh, speed up the process, Your Honor. Um, I think... Um, uh, with all due respect to the to the members of the court, I think the court administrator should um, be given that uh, prerogative no? to um, dismiss complaints against judges and personnel uh, uh, where the complaints are viewed to be uh, judicial in nature, pure harassment, or without merit at all. And, um, and only will it go to the Supreme Court if, let's say, there are questions on that uh, judgment of the court administrator. Yeah. So it's still subject to review? Uh, only only if uh, the aggrieved party... So it's not yet final because you said subject to be reviewed. No, uh, Your Honor, if only if the complainant who filed the complaint uh, uh, originally is not satisfied with the decision of the court administrator, then we let go to the Supreme Court, Your Honor. I see. Uh, anyway, should you be appointed? Uh, I think you can make that recommendation. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Actually, um, I'm just, um, I, the, the only reason that I'm not doing that or uh, making that recommendation is because uh, the members of the court might say that uh, because it's me who is uh, 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 doing it. No, but. Um, the one I mentioned earlier with regard uh, during the time of uh, Chief Justice Corona, that recommendation or that idea actually came from him, Your Honor. And I said that if that is uh, the wisdom of the court, then uh, we will uh, abide by it, Your Honor. You heard uh, Attorney Gatdula on his view on divorce. Do you agree with his views? Uh, I, I agree, Your Honor, with the views more of uh, Dean Villanueva, Your Honor, on the on the issue of divorce. Dean Villanueva, you have been you have been a bar examiner. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, in what subject? In commercial law, Your Honor. Commercial law only. Yes, Your Honor. About criminal. Uh, no, Your Honor. No. Are you familiar with replebin or replebin ban? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. How much is a replebin ban? I'm, I'm not really aware of the amount, Your Honor. If the main case is dismissed without prejudice, what happens to the ban? If the main case is dismissed without prejudice, the replebin, uh, the bond itself, Your Honor. I think that that uh, that uh, bond gets uh, forfeited, Your Honor, because the replebin is supposed to su support uh, an appeal, uh, preventing the execution of the. I'm sorry, the bond gets uh, refunded, Your Honor, because the replebin is supposed to prevent the execution of the uh, judgment pending appeal. That's yes. my understanding. The amount yeah. of the replevin bond is double the value. Mm -hmm. If you forfeit it immediately, or you, you do, you not, do you conduct a hearing? I'm not sure, Your Honor. Sure. Okay. How are you in criminal law? I have a working knowledge in criminal law, Your Honor. Okay. The I think. Basic only. In People versus Valdez, the information did not sufficiently set forth the facts and circumstances. And it was ruled there that uh, the information was defective. On the other hand, in People versus Batin, The allegation of an attending circumstance such as treachery in the information is sufficient. What is your personal view? Uh, Your Honor, on what particular issue? My personal view? Uh, 
the allegation of the do you need to uh, describe the specifics or just the, uh, the just the circumstance the I think because of the requirement of our constitution due process uh, especially in criminal proceedings it is important that the information completely sets out on its face uh, the elements that would constitute a crime charged uh, in order to allow the accused to be able to, to plead properly uh, on whether he's guilty or not guilty to that and if, he's, if he pleads not guilty to properly uh, prepare his defense, Your Honor. You mean uh, if you, you are not satisfied with alleged uh, you mean to say if for example the circumstance of teachery was alleged it is, it is not sufficient for you uh, it, it is not sufficient unless it shows in the information the, the ultimate facts that support uh, the character uh, that aggravating circum uh, that circumstance of treachery your honor Tony Gadula, do you agree I think it should properly set out the circumstances um, otherwise it will not allow the defendant to be able to raise the proper defenses if the circumstances are not laid out also, uh, it's going to be just a blanket statement of pro probable cause. I don't think it, it, should, it would be proper. It would be a waste of the prosecutor's time and later on the court's time. Um, I think the circumstances should be set out and so as to uh, make a proper determination of whether the case could be dismissed earlier or not. So it will be a long information? Not, not necessarily, Your Honor. Enough to be able to uh, determine... For the accused to understand. Uh, yes, Your Honor. And if... Truly, for example, in the example you mentioned, whether or not indeed treachery is indeed there. It's easy to say treachery, but at least the facts could be, the bare facts could be mentioned on whether or not indeed it constitutes treachery. Court Administrator Marquez, what is your position on that? I think the information should uh, set out all the elements that would constitute the crime, not necessarily the, the details, uh, because that can be later on... Um, uh, determine prove that you adduce in evidence the, during to trial. Prove that that's right, Your you, Honor. You need not allege that in the information. Details, yes, Your Honor. How about the right of an accused to be informed of the charges? Is that sufficient, alleging teachery only? I think uh, it should be. It should be stated. Um, uh, it should give a little bit uh, uh, some circumstance on how uh, treachery uh, uh, was uh, was committed, Your Honor. Uh, then the, 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 the word uh, treachery, I think, uh, would not suffice, Your Honor. Okay. This was uh, covered by a Supreme Court decision last August. August 6, People versus Solar. Dean Villanueva, when you were a bar examin examiner, uh, was the MCQ uh, used? No, Your Honor. When, the twen when, the when you were an examiner? No, Your Honor. I, I was a bar examiner in the last bar exam, Your Honor, under the chair per uh, chairmanship of now. Del Castillo. So it was an all essay uh, problem solving type of uh, exam, Your Honor. But you have you heard of MCQ exam? Yes, Your Honor. Do you know the four principal categories of uh, MCQ? Now I I'm questions. aware of uh, three of them, Your Honor. Not four. Not four, Your Honor. What are those three? Now, the first one, Your Honor, is just uh, a, re a recall of uh, basic principles. The MCQ is, is the question is done in such a way as to be able to uh, ask. Um, the examinees, whether they can recall from the facts the doctrine that's laid out there. It's a familiarization with certain doctrines and principles and procedures, Your Honor. The second one is uh, the analytical uh, aspect, Your Honor, where the facts uh, differ, uh, basically shows uh, layers of uh, circumstances or layers of thinking that will Im invite uh, the examinees to actually, not only just to recall, 
but to determine what is the doctrine or principle involved uh, that arises from the sets uh, given in the stem of the problem. And the, and the third one, Your Honor, is the problem-solving uh, type of MCQ uh, that basically lays out um, either uh, the facts, the important decisions, or uh, facts of a decision of the court uh, that will be used as the basis by which uh, uh, a similar problem solving would be done, but instead you're given four uh, choices at most to determine which is the best answer, Your Honor. You were never... I'm not sure, but uh, I read somewhere that you were once government uh, of official, no? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, in, in the year 2011 up to 2016, June, I was the uh, chairman of the newly constituted uh, public agency, the Governance Commission for Government Owned and Controlled Corporations, Your Honor. I see. What is the general lo law on uh, salaries? Uh, general law on silence uh, has constitutional basis, Your Honor, but it first appeared as an implement implementation. My understanding is under the, the anti grap and Corrupt Practices Act and then into the Code of Ethics uh, for government officials and employees that all require uh, basically the declaration, uh, the filing by members of, uh, by officers and employees of the government of a statement of assets and liability, uh, liabilities, Your Honor. And when do you file them? My understanding, Your, uh, Your Honor, is that uh, from the moment of uh, within a certain number of days from appointment, you must submit into public office, you must file a salary. I think that's 30 days, Your Honor. And then every year thereafter, uh, the deadline is, uh, is around the end of uh, April, you must uh, file them. Uh, and then um, the moment you leave uh, uh, government service within a certain number of days, you must now file your last uh, salon in order to uh, verify uh, what amounts are there at the time you, you left uh, government, Your Honor. What, what is the prescriptive period for filing a case for violation of the salon law? I'm not sure, Your Honor. It's your no. Attorney McCourt, Ad Marquez. Has anybody been charged with non filing of SAL and before the court, your office? I have not come across. Um, any complaints uh, against uh, non-filing or complaints of uh, non-filing of sal in uh, against any of our uh, judges or court personnel, Your Honor, in the... Are you aware of the prescriptive period? Um, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Tony Gadula. You have no idea. Probably going to be one or two years. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Oh. Four what is the assurance fund? That's very basic. Fund. Assurance fund, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, pass your honor. I, I don't want to waste the. You course. got your land registration, look. Orange title? I don't even think I learned it. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll take a pass to your honor on that one. Oh. Dean Villanueva? The assurance fund, Your Honor, is that provided for the, I think, the public uh, registration law uh, that provides that uh, because of the uh, in unassailability, uh, imprescriptibility uh, of uh, the torrent's title once it is issued, there are those who, whose titles will be lost because another person has been able to register their land. Uh, and that person has, was a registrant in good faith, and for uh, uh, in good faith, and therefore the sanctity of uh, the, that historian system now has to be respected. So ultimately, the one who was supposed to to be the owner of that land has lost it because of proper registration. And the assurance fund has been set up by the government to to reimburse and compensate uh, the the aggrieved party for 
what he has lost because of the importance of trying to provide for uh, the system of uh, the torrent system, Your Honor. Uh, Court Administrator Marquez, uh, within what period do you, do you collect the assurance or do you apply against the assurance fund? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, I was not able to look into that. Find the period. Um, from what time do you count it? The period. Well, I'd like to think, Your Honor, from the time that uh, uh, the subsequent registration was uh, made, Your Honor. Dean Villanueva. I would think that that would be the proper period to look at it from the time it is clear that your request for registration has been denied because another one has or a title has been issued uh, in favor of another person, uh, Your Honor. That would be a reasonable time to, to determine when to, to file an application, Your Honor. Tony, get the answer, Your Honor. Same. <laughs> In the case of uh, Istinapolis versus Register of Deed, it runs from one registration by the innocent purchaser and to actual knowledge of the title holder. I think that will be all. Thank you very much, Your All Excuse. Thank you, Honorable Justice uh, Jose Catal Mendoza. Uh, with uh, that last question, I don't see any uh, any other questions. I will. Uh, I don't have clear mandate to ask questions. I'm just here to uh, preside, and I think I'll just stick to that uh, lack of uh, mandate to ask questions. Uh, on behalf of uh, the JBC, uh, Honorable Justice Atal Mendoza. Honorable Justice Toribe Ilao Jr., Honorable Justice Noel Jimenez Tiham, and Honorable Franklin J. De Montevideo Sr., uh, we would like to thank you for your attendance and your response to the questions. And we wish you the best and the, the, all the good luck. And personally, my prayers will be for you. Thank you, uh, to everybody. And uh, this meeting and uh, Panel, public panel interview of candidates today, September 9, is hereby included. Thank you, gentlemen. Your honors, what time shall we resume?